What's going on, everyone? Welcome on into the ID at Xbox showcase right here on Twitch Gaming. Now, I am one of your co-hosts today, Story Mode Bay, and I have the honor of being joined by the incredible Trisha Hirschberger. Trisha, how I are you feeling today? I have the honor of being joined by the incredible no. Story Mode Bay. <laughs> no. <laughs> this how are you so doing exciting. today? Yes. Right? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, Brianna and I today are going to walk you through so many exciting things. We're going to unveil new games. We're going to talk about indie games. I love my indie games. So on today's show, we're going to be showcasing and celebrating indie Xbox games, right? And we'll have so many talented devs joining us throughout the day to talk about their games, including, but not limited to, Among Us, Moon Glow Bay, Soup Pot, Nobody Saves the World, Death's Door, and 12 Minutes. And each of our developer guests will sit down for a conversation with some of our favorite streamers and creators, including awesome folks like Kate Stark and Stallion83, um, Donut Age, and Technique, and Blind Gamer Steve. So many fun folks. We'll also have special interviews with uh, Chris Charla from ID at Xbox. And throughout the day, we're gonna be dropping exclusive new game trailers as well. So if you're an indie games fan, this is the place to be. We'll have Victoria Tran from Innersloth will be here to discuss Among Us. Gwen Foster and Trina from Chicken Club will chat their new game, Soup Pot. Lewis, Lewis Antonio from Annapurna Interactive will get into their highly anticipated game, 12 Minutes. I cannot wait to see some of that. Uh, we've also got Graham Smith and Ian Campbell from Drinkbox Studios. They're going to be here discussing Nobody Saves the World. Zach and Lou from Bunny Hug will get into all things Moon Glow Bay. Mark Foster and David Fenn from Acid Nerve will talk about Death's Door. We have a packed lineup for you today. So uh, it is going to be awesome. And as I mentioned, we will have that special interview with Chris Charla from ID at Xbox, which is awesome. Yes. Oh my gosh. I am so excited about this. Now, before we do get started with our show, I do want to remind everyone at home, please sound off in the chat. We want to know what you guys think. I mean, I already see the chat moving and shaking as it is. I am super excited about this. So without further ado, uh, I want to remind everyone throughout today's ID at Xbox at Twitch Gaming Indie Game Showcase, we will be airing exclusive new game trailers for the very first time. Uh, some will feature gameplay updates to highly anticipated indie titles. Others will be brand new, never before seen game trailers. But that's not all we have. So make sure you stay tuned throughout the show and share your reactions in the Twitch chat. So everyone, let's go ahead and get into it. First up, we're dropping some new gameplay trailers. Let's take a look.
units entering cluster 13, behave, or I'll have you f***ing recycled. You have shown an aptitude for applying lethal solutions to conflicted situations. We wish to test your abilities by giving you a special assignment. Success, and you'll be given a chance at earning your freedom. Kill me?
All right, Void Train. I see what you're doing there. Uh, Void Train looked really cool, that last one that we just saw. I was getting like yes. a Outer Wilds meets Abduction kind of vibe from that. Uh, yes. Brianna, were there any of those trailers that particularly jumped out at you? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of looking at, I think it was called Wild at Heart. It almost mm -hmm. reminded me of Don't Starve a little bit. It looks like you're trapped in the forest, maybe with a friend. I'm very excited. I mean, Xbox came out of the gate swinging with this showcase. I am beyond excited to see what's next up. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I The first one that they showed, that Exo Mecha uh, mm. game, I saw some people in chat were like, is this like... Uh, mech battle Titanfall-esque thing. I mean, the cool news is that a lot of these trailers that we just saw, if not all of them, I might be mistaken on this, but uh, a lot of them said coming 2021. So those are games we can expect this year. Um, like I said, I'm a big fan of indie games. I'm a big fan of the ID at Xbox program, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later about mm -hmm. how the specifics of the program work. But bringing all these indie games to light is what it's all about. So Omni, mm -hmm. we got to see a trailer for, and I've gotten yes. to play a, a very early build of that, and it is so adorable. Oh. So we've got a lot of fun stuff uh, coming up and a lot of fun stuff here that we've seen already. It's been awesome. Uh, Brianna, yes. do you play a lot of indie games on your Twitch channel? I do. I kind of switch off. I mean, my favorite thing about indie games, honestly, is the art style. I am such a sucker for not only good graphics, but just visually appeasing games. And I feel like with indie games, you get so much of that. And also, by the way, I do want to remind the Twitch chat at home, please sound off. What game did you see from that last trailer? Are you excited about? I would love to hear it. And you never know, your comment can end up right here on the big screen. Yes, I see uh, Burnt Toast. Burnt Toast TJ or Burnt Toast J in chat says, so great to see such wonderful support for indies. Yes, 100% yes. Um, so yeah, that was Exo Mecco, I believe Ascent was the name of the second one, Omni, The Wild at Heart, and uh, Void Train there at the end. Really, really cool. Oh, yes, I am excited. Oh, Ooh, yes. I love Let's that we're able now. to okay, see so this here was, again. Here was Exo Mecca, I believe is what this one was called again. And this is the one that some people were comparing to Titanfall. I don't know. My first thought when I saw those mechs, I saw kind of the circular light design in the center of their chest. And I was like, Pacific Ooh, yeah. Rim? Uh, now, not all of them have that. But this is reminding me of every great mech battle uh, that I know. And look at that. We have underwater. I think I saw a grapple mm -hmm. hook. There it is, a grapple hook mechanic in this. Is this the type of game you think you could see yourself jumping into? See, I'm a little funny when I play games. I'm not a huge fan of first person shooter type games. However, the graphics are very, very nice. I mean, and it looks like it's action packed. There's so much going on. Like you said, you're able to go underwater. It looks like you were shooting at a helicopter in the last clip that we saw. This looks pretty good. I might have to give it a try. I love the folks in chat right now that are so hyped for the Among Us segments coming up that they're just saying this of game course. looks super sus. This trailer looks so sus. I get it. I get it. But yeah, that was uh, just one of the... So that was one, two, three, four, five trailers already shown. And like we said, we've got a packed show for you today. So lots and lots of trailers coming up. But I thought Exo Mecha looked super, super cool. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that Cyberpunk one, I think it was called Ascent. I think the, the Twitter handle oh, was at Ascent that's the right. Game. Um, that Cyberpunk one felt very like Shadowrun-esque to me Ooh. in a good way. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I played through Cyberpunk 2077 and it didn't quite scratch the Cyberpunk itch in the way that I was hoping for. So maybe this game totally could. Maybe, maybe okay. we'll see. Um, Fair and enough. Omni just looks stunningly beautiful. Mm -hmm, Is Omni more mm -hmm. the type of game you would traditionally stream? Yeah, I would kind of look more towards Omni. Like I was saying before, Wild of Heart is definitely something that captivated me and caught my eye as soon as I saw it. So I am very excited. And I like that you said that about that cyberpunk feel because, you know, some people are kind of looking for something in that genre if cyberpunk didn't exactly do it for them. So I'm excited <laughs> about these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see uh, Mundane in chat says, uh, Mundane Salad says, Shadow Run is greater than Cyberpunk. You know what? Ooh. You said it, not me. Um, but I don't spicy. entirely disagree with you. Very spicy, <laughs> very spicy, spicy take on there today.
Um, so folks, like I said, that was just a snippet of some of the fun that we have for you today, but let's bring in our first guest. So our first guest on today's show is the senior director of the ID at Xbox program, which has been helping independent developers self-publish their games on Microsoft's Xbox consoles for the last seven years. And if you're wondering what types of games ID at Xbox are working on right now that will be coming soon to a console near you, well, here's a sneak peek. Hello, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you feeling today? Good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Now, for everyone at home watching that aren't already familiar with the ID at Xbox program, can you explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, sure. So basically, we're a program at Microsoft that enables independent developers to self-publish their games. So they come to xdocs.com slash ID, they sign up, they tell us what kind of game they're making, and we send them dev kits, they start development, they make the game, and then we, uh, they're, the, they're the publisher, we try and help amplify the promotion with things like um, what's happening today, and then the games come out, people play them, everybody's happy, it's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. awesome. Mm -hmm. I personally love indie games, and I think we've seen indie games have this 
uh, not even not even resurgence, but kind of like just being being brought more into the public eye in the last decade or so. Um, and it makes it a little bit hard for some people to kind of qualify what is indeed an indie game. So I want to ask mm-hmm. you, Chris, what are indie games all about in your mind? Well, that's actually one thing we do in the program is we don't try and define it. I, in fact, I used to have a, a like a buster on the outside of my wall, office that said indie with a little buster through it because I was like, you know what, like we're... I, I'm old, and I spent the '90s as a punk rocker arguing about what was punk and what wasn't punk, and like we don't need to do that. You know what I mean? If some, it, it, to me, an independent game is really all about creative control. If a developer has creative control, you know they have that independence. But you know we have folks in the program who are single individuals. You know, one woman, one man making a game. We have studios in the program that are hundreds of people making a game. So we don't stress about it. Like our focus is just on helping people get their games onto Xbox, helping get them great, and then making sure that players get to see them and have a good time. Mm, Cool. That is incredible. Now, Chris, I know I'm sure there are so many amazing moments that you were able to experience throughout your seven years with the program. But if you could pick one, what would be your proudest accomplishment? Uh, you know what? I can't, I can't, the, the thing that like really gets both me and the, 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 the whole team on ID, um, going is really like when we're able to help a developer, like a lot of times, especially a first game, like ship that first game. And that, mm-hmm. that like always feels great. Or when we're able to work with developers from like all over the world, like we work with developers in more than a hundred countries on every single continent, except mm-hmm. Antarctica is really cool. So it's, it's hard to pick a, a proud moment but my maybe my favorite moment was um i think it was e3 i can't remember which year and um it was right when we unveiled like the full cuphead trailer and i i'd seen the trailer i knew how good it was and i'm on stage i got the privilege of introducing the the molden Howers, and um the the lights go on the molden Howers, and they go off me and and then the studio mdhr logo comes up on what at the time was the largest 4k screen in existence and I knew everybody's socks were about to get blown off. And just standing there in the dark on the stage, looking up at the Studio MDHR logo was like, I still get goosebumps. I have goosebumps right now talking about it. It was like, <laughs> it was such a cool moment. It was such a cool moment for them and such a cool moment for everybody who likes um, to be, you know, just excited by games. So I, the, the, to me, that's like, it's one of my favorite moments in my career. I remember mm. that moment. I remember when Cuphead was first unveiled at E3 and everyone was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> um, and, and it delivered. I mean, Cuphead's a fantastic game. Um, mm-hmm. So what excites you right now? Like, what's the most exciting thing about the indie game scene in 2021, in your opinion? <laughs> Just a variety. I mean, we just saw on that trailer and, and, and all through today, we're just going to see so much variety of games. And, and you know, it, it, it used to be that I think when people heard the word indie game, there was this thought of like, okay, this is side-scrolling pixel art. And there's still a lot of great side-scrolling pixel art games, but there's everything from first-person shooters to, you know, every genre under the sun, new genres nobody's ever thought of before. And to, to me, what's so exciting is these games come from everywhere. Right, I think there's a game. I don't want to give it away. Maybe it's a, a reveal, but there's a game we're going to see in a little bit from um, two devs in the Philippines. It's really, really neat. Uh, Despelote, which was just in the trailer, an airport for aliens run by dogs, where you like go around and interact with like clip art dogs that are rotating. Um, like those are all super cool. And then you have games that just come out of nowhere, uh, not really out of nowhere, but like Shotgun Farmers, which is a game that uh, launched on Xbox. Um, and, and was from one person and dominated the sales charts on Xbox for like a couple weeks. It was like the number one game on Xbox. And that is just so cool that the world today uh, like enables that kind of thing to happen. So that's what I love. I just love the variety. Mm-hmm. I'm always amazed learning at some of the sizes at, of some of these development companies. Does it blow your mind what smaller indie teams are able to create and produce in comparison to triple A companies? Absolutely. I mean, we, we've seen like such great, I, I think we just call it like democratization of development with the rise <laughs> of engines like Unreal and Unity and Game Maker. Um, it really has now enabled um, the focus, you know, games is still incredibly amount of hard work to make, but the focus is on like how good my idea is, how good my story is. Like game, game developers are no longer gated by the technology as much as they were 10 and 15 years ago. So that's that's awesome to see. And it's it's also been awesome to see how things like Game Pass, um, 
have enabled um, so many players to experience so many games. It's been it's just really really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is super cool, and I, I for one, love being able to jump on Game Pass and try something completely new uh, because it's worked into that program, and we will definitely see games today in the ID at Xbox program that are available on Game Pass, uh, but not all of them that we'll show today are, I don't think. Isn't that correct, Chris? It's some of That's them. That's right. Yeah, it's a variety. You know, <laughs> games like, um, you know... I'm trying to think, like, off the top of my head, Genesis Noir ship recently, that was a Game Pass game, but Shotgun Farmer is not a Game Pass game, you know, and, and there's a huge amount of variety that's in Game Pass, which is fantastic, and there's a huge amount of variety of games that are, you know, not in Game Pass, so it's 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 just great, like, uh, there's just a, a tons to play, um, and that makes us feel really good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, where do you think that indie games are headed next, so say in the next decade or two? Uh, I, that is a great question, and and I, and the the answer I'm gonna give is that I have no idea, but I mean that in the best possible way. <laughs> you know, if if you had asked me when we started ID if somebody if somebody was gonna come up with a game where you shoot shotguns and when you miss the shot a new shotgun grows out of the ground, I never would have guessed that. If you had asked me is somebody gonna make like a game that's hand animated 1930s animation, I never, you know, I never would have guessed that, and so. What I love about indie games is they're always surprising us. They're always giving us something new. And so when I say I have no idea what we're going to see in 10 years, like, that's what excites me. Like, if I knew what was going to happen, I might not be as excited. So, so yeah, I think in the best possible way, I have no idea. <laughs> that's really interesting you say that. I am kind of curious with these next generation consoles that have just released very recently. How has that transition been? Has it been kind of difficult or...? No, not really. We've been seeding uh, Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S's to our developers for a while, and um, we've been really excited to see how many independent developers are supporting features like smart delivery, where you, you might have an Xbox One today, and you buy the game, and then when you get your Xbox Series S or your Xbox Series X, you just download the updated version of it at no additional cost. Um, and, and you know, independent developers are always surprising us. And so... Um, Next-gen features, whether it's ray tracing or smart delivery, folks are taking advantage of them in really interesting ways. And um, so it, it's been um, it's been exciting. It's been exciting to see the games, but one thing that we're proud of is that the transition itself for developers has been boring. And I mean that, again, in the best possible way. <laughs> that, you know, they get this new system and they can start taking advantage of the power of it, but they don't have to get a PhD to figure out how to use it. And so... Um, you know, that, that is kind of always our goal, to make it as easy as possible to ship so that the focus for developers can be on their game, on taking advantage of the hardware, not like fighting against the hardware and just being excited they got something to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that context in particular, boring is fantastic for the indie exactly. devs, I'm sure. <laughs> right. um, so speaking of indie devs, what advice would you give to any dev teams out there who might be watching who would want to apply to ID at Xbox? Yeah, just reach out. Um, it's uh, xbox.com slash ID. Um, you, you can see from today and from the 2000 games that have come through the program um, in the last seven years, um, we love variety. We're eager to support like all developers, especially if you're a new developer, this is your first game, maybe you're not from the United States or you know, you're from a different territory, like please apply. Um, you know, we're really eager to help you get your games uh, on the platform. There's a huge audience of players who want to play your games. You know, I, I don't want to be crass, but but independent developers on, on Xbox have earned more than, you know, $2 billion, like way over $2 billion in the last seven years from shipping their games. And that just feels really good because it means that we have a sustainable marketplace where developers can have success and keep making their games. And so I guess that would be my message. There is a lot of success on Xbox, whether it's getting millions and millions of people to play your game through Game Pass, just shipping your game and having lots and lots of people play it and enjoy it. You know, please come aboard. Mm -hmm. Wow, Chris, I want to thank you for taking the time to spend and chat with us. But before we do say goodbye, can you let everyone at home know how to apply to the program? Yeah, absolutely. Devs just need to go to xbox.com slash ID. And you can fill out an application there. I think it maybe takes like five or six minutes to apply. And, um, you know, that's the easy part. The hard part is making the game. But the part of <laughs> building a relationship with Microsoft and everything like that, we try to make that as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Well, again, thank you so very much for joining us today. This has been so enlightening to kind of take a peek behind the curtain at how all of this works. It mm -hmm. has been so lovely having you, Chris. If people want to find you online, is there a place that they can follow you personally or should they just follow ID at Xbox? Uh, they can follow uh, at ID underscore Xbox or I'm uh, at IOCAT on Twitter. Awesome. Perfect. Chris, thank you so much for popping by today and uh, hopefully we'll see you here on Twitch Gaming again soon. Absolutely. Thanks Thank a lot, you. guys. Bye. <laughs> oh, that was so awesome. And it, it seems almost simple to, for developers to apply. I didn't know that it was almost that easy. That's pretty cool. Yeah, go to a website and it takes about five or six minutes. And uh, I've known about the ID at Xbox program for years and how it helps indie devs get their games out there and get their games finished. Um, and what an awesome program it is. But yeah, I also didn't know how easy it was for devs yeah. to apply. So for anyone watching this who has a game mulling around up here, even if it's just in concept phase, xbox.com slash ID is what Chris told us. And uh, fill it out there and see if you can help, if Xbox can help bring your game to reality and, you know, bring it to Xbox yes. consoles. Oh my gosh. Is... I mean, I feel like what Chris was saying, sometimes starting is the hardest part, but to even put your foot in the door by applying to the program, I mean, oh my gosh, I know there's some developers in the chat watching, go ahead and get started. I, I see you guys in there. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I absolutely love, uh, like I said, I've been following this program for a while. When you go to a convention like an E3 and you go to kind of Microsoft's convention floor booth, like their section of it, there's always an ID at Xbox section. And mm. whereas a lot of people go in and kind of hunt for the big triple A's, I'm usually scanning the floor for the ID at Xbox section because that's where I'm going to go and find the games that, like you said, Brianna, you know, if you're in it for art style, if you're looking yes. for like the, the game that brings out all the feels that you need to have a tissue box handy for. If you're looking for those fantastic uh, scores and compositions, a lot of times that's where I'm like, ooh, I will find something really unique that maybe I haven't checked out here, um, mm -hmm. which is just, it's just fantastic. And you know, as we mentioned, Cuphead uh, was an ID at Xbox game. There's so many, so uh, I believe Oxenfree, uh, oh, yes. Might have been originally as well. Um, so many great games. And I know people in chat are uh, teasing and hoping for games <laughs> that we will talk about a little bit later in the show as well. So don't worry, we've got lots of stuff coming. We do. We have so much coming. But up next, everyone, streamer Kate Stark will sit down with the team behind the new game Moon Glow Bay, which takes place along the peaceful eastern Canadian coastline during the 1980s. In Moon Glow Bay, you play as an old rookie angler struggling to keep your business afloat while coming to terms with the death of your long life partner. Lifelong partner, sorry. There's the feels, but after yep. exploring the world a little bit, you come to learn not everything is what it seems. Let's take a look at the trailer. Well, Guppy, you did it. Your first catch. 40 years, and you still surprise me. I know this place seems strange. A fishing town afraid to fish. But that's why our new venture might just stay afloat. Because all those stories about the mystical monsters of Moonglow are exactly that. Stories. This bay is full of amazing new creatures waiting to be discovered. So we'll find them and share them with the world. Together. As long as this book is by your side. So am I. Welcome home. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, Zach and Lou. Um, welcome to the show. Can Thank you tell you. us a little Thank bit you. about Moon Glow Bay? 
course, yeah. we all had Zach. <laughs> sure. Uh, so Moonglow is like uh, like was said in, in East uh, a fishing RPG slice of life set in the eastern coast of 1980s Canada. No fictional. Yeah. And <laughs> and, and uh, it's in a town that people are afraid to fish because of mysterious things. Yeah, and weird going sea on creatures. The, yeah. Well, it it starts out like a kind of scenario where the game is very regular and you're like, oh, it's just a normal fish. It gets weirder and weirder, and and you're like, okay, what's actually going on yeah. here? People have these myths, and there there's some truth to these myths, and so it, yeah, it's and, a little spooky. And you get your fish, and you get your cook, and sell, yeah. and make friends around the town, mm -hmm. and build the town out. So like while you're trying to explore explore the world, figure out what happened to your uh, long lost partner, the town itself is going through their own struggles with uh, their potential closing and, and inability to to grow and survive. So yeah. it's kind of like a in tandem. Everyone growth, helping each other. Helping each other. Yeah. yeah. Sounds amazing. Now, without spoiling too much, what can you tell us mm -hmm. about the town and what went into creating life in Moonglow Bay? Oh, it does. So the, the town is having its centennial, so it's going to be 100 years old and it's completely falling apart. It has no money. The town hall is closing and you kind of like got to help well, it. You moved into the town three years prior with your partner thinking like, okay, we're going to retire here and we're going to just open up a little fishing shack. But then uh, they go on their adventure, uh, your partner goes on their adventure to start up the shop and they, they never come back. So you, so now you're kind of like left alone. You're like, oh, I don't know what to do. And everyone else is also closing down. So you're like, oh, I, need to, I need to, like, I want this to survive. And yeah. your daughter comes back and it's like, kind of like picks you up and says, let's do this. Let's figure this out. And let's fix this town up. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and. Yeah. There was so much like I did so much research on my on my side like doing concept art and stuff uh, about Eastern Canada in the eighties like going to like little groups and checking like people's memories and the photos that they took of the of the east coast of Canada so and also like, in the fashion because even though it was set in the eighties the fashion hadn't caught up for like twenty years yeah so, no <laughs> so. no it definitely had not um, no. <laughs> well I mean. What inspired the story on Moonglow Bay then? Because it seems that you did a lot of research into it. So you must like, and very specifically yeah. Eastern Canada as well. So wh what inspired that? Uh, well, I, mean, I like, uh, I always like fishing games. I think a lot of us always very much like playing the mini games, I'm mini one of fishing people, games yes. and RPGs. And, yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, it's one of those things I was like, well, what if like, this has to be feasible as a whole scope game. And I found- And with like, loads of- other mini games that yeah, you can also it's play. Yeah, like Legend of the River King like was almost tw like, 10 years ago, almost 13 years ago yeah. since it came out and I was like, nah, this has to like we need to kind of like see what's feasible here. So And like the the story is like Zach and I met uh, living in Quebec. Yeah. Uh and like my family has history with fishing. Zach has As a kid, has... I, I I helped run a little fishing shop uh, selling fish by the lakeside and yeah. And it was kind of like, you know, there's this connection. We're like, this is actually really chill. We wanted to make a game that was very relaxing. And this is the perfect kind of thing because fishing is pretty chill. And <laughs> yeah, we just felt like it was the perfect environment to start off. And then we just from there started researching East Coast because we want to go into the ocean, get this vast space. And, and, and also it, it was a little bit of wanderlust of mine because my my dream has always been like I'm gonna list I'm gonna go live in Nova Scotia. It seems like the most <laughs> beautiful place, most calming place. So it kind kind of has that that part as well. Yeah, like that uh, yeah that starry eyed feel of like oh new new town beautiful and so that's why like w one of the things in the game is to kind of build this town up and make it yeah. prettier over time. So there is also a little bit of mystery around the story and around yeah. the town. Uh, are you able to tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, like a little hint, which is basically like, there's a lore that exists in the world itself. It's not like the fish aren't typical. Uh, they start off typical, but as you get deeper, you get into different biomes. So like regular water is what you're seeing right now, but then like, it spreads into like these sulfur zones, these like heavy glacier zones. And you're like, how does, this doesn't exist in oceans. This, how does this happen? And so it's kind of like the, yeah, the and mystery of that's the, also the, like part of the thing that is making people so afraid. Like people go fishing and they don't come back, and and, and they just it's completely so bewildering. it's everything is kind of fueled by myths in the town because nobody yeah. has the courage to actually go fish and find out if the myths are true or not. So you kind of like oh, everyone just gossips to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So you can go talk around. You're gonna fill up a journal to to to, to see what these myths that people have accumulated are, and then you can go and like. 
see what truth there is to this and something like there's always gonna be like okay go to this location you're gonna find this this weird fish that's gonna like nibble at your ankles you're like wait what and so yeah so it's like stuff like that uh for the player to find out uh so more specifically on that how do the game mechanics work what can players expect uh when playing moon glow bay for the first time yeah so it, it's a core loop of going out fishing and then coming back and cooking whatever you've caught uh, in your home, and then you and, sell it at your vending yeah, machine. Yeah, it's, it's a lesser, like, less intense mechanic, the selling itself. Yeah. The cooking is like a bunch of fun mini games. Like uh, Cooking Mama style kind of stuff. Yeah, and the fishing is like, you have several different kinds of fishing. You can, uh, rod fishing is the one that goes the most complex. It has, like, different levels of Of, of difficulty based on the fish. And, and equipment, and... and then there is trap fishing, there is... Ice fishing, ice fishing net fishing. And line fishing, which is, like, a little bit more musical. So, like, you choose the style that you want to... You mm -hmm. want to fish with and tricks which capture this hundred plus. Yeah, and there's like creatures. certain fish that can only be caught with certain tools, so you're gonna have to kind of go around and f and figure out what these combinations are. And also in your boat, you can expand with the money you've accumulated. You can expand the size of your boat, the tooling within it, uh, to get a, a little bed and a, and a kitchen in the boat itself. So you can uh, go so you can fishing want, for days. Yeah. So you can go fishing out at sea oh, for days rather wonderful. than always having to come back to town. Yeah. I love the sound of that. Now, I know a question that a lot of our audience is going to be wondering and asking, and I am myself, can you pet the dog? Because I noticed there's a dog. Yes. Can you pet the dog? <laughs> you, you can pet the dog. The dog is going to follow He's, you. He follows it's, you around. It's your little companion. His name is Waffles. Yeah. He's adorable. Waffles! Yes. Oh, I've been loving this game already. This is my new favorite <laughs> game for sure. Um, Lou, you were mentioning the art style. What inspired uh, and influenced the art style for this game? So, uh, Zach and I, like, ever since we met, we did a bunch of, like, little mock-ups and stuff, trying to figure out, like, what game do we want to make? And it started from the principle that Zach does voxel art. And also, like, I wanted to, to bring something really relaxing. So one of the things that, it doesn't look like it because it's all squared and it's, like, has a specific palette and stuff. But one thing that inspires me a lot on their direction is, uh, like, Ponyo from, from Studio Ghibli, the yes, movie. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so it's kind of like, uh, as, as well as Animal Crossing, like, and Harvest, the old Harvest Moons from the GBA. So all those things that are very relaxing games that kind of slice of life and... Uh, all the colors are much softer. Yeah. It's, it's all intentionally, like, catered so yeah. you don't feel intimidated by anything, even if, like, our myths are a little bit spooky kind of thing, so... Yeah, we kind of wanted the player to just, like, get home from work, in this case, like, finish work, and then, like, maybe open open the game and just relax and distress from, from life. I'm seeing a lot of people in chat mention that exact that exact thing, so I think you're on the right track. Uh, what sort of <laughs> playtime can people expect? Uh, is it single player? Is it multiplayer? What, what do we think? It's single player and um, couch co-op. Co couch co -op. It can be drop in, drop out. Like it's more more of a style of like assist. So if you're having difficulty catching a fish, your, your friend can just like or your daughter or, or anyone can just grab the controller and say, I'm going to help you catch this fish. And you can grab onto your player one and pull yeah. with them to pull the fish in. So, so you go alongside the, the story and stuff and, and the playtime. The playtime, I'm we're estimating roughly around 10 to 12 hours. It yeah. uh, depends if you want to be a completionist and try to get all the 100 plus fish mm -hmm. in the game. And all the side quests and stuff, or if you just want to follow the... Or if you just want to gun through the story. Yeah. So just depending on how players want to play. I love that. Yeah, um, so what... it, it, the range can be pretty, pretty, pretty big. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, what are you most excited as the developers? What are you most excited for players to experience when playing this for the first time? <sighs> for me, it's I want to. I'm excited to see what people, how people react to the fish that they pull up, because <laughs> we get really weird with their designs. And oh god, I really smart. love like for me the f the whole friendship system, like how you can become f best friends with people in town and they can tell you like their life stories or you can help them with their little their little struggles and stuff like that 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 is the kind of things that that i love in games so i'm looking forward to people seeing that as well mm -hmm. that's fantastic yeah. now tell us really quickly about um scripting an indie game and how is it challenging yes. with that aspect of game design it's uh, it's chaotic um <laughs> <laughs> it, it's one of those things that initially you're gonna have a like set idea where you're like okay oh, you have this and it's of... gonna be so big oh yeah you're gonna have this set <laughs> yeah. idea that's massive the scope is always gonna be huge and then you kind of as you're building out you kind of build the first section and then you're like okay how long is this gonna be and then you play through and you're like mm, all right yeah that um and can we keep pulling out this amount of like 
story and work and yeah, bring so you through the entire game. Like we've been making this game for over over two, three, three years, years yeah. and uh, a lot of iteration has gone through and we're just like, okay, yeah, we, yeah. Need, we have to keep, keep cutting. And it's interesting like, it's because much. we also like some, we're still developing the game and like as we develop it, we play it and we, like, Mm, the storyline actually doesn't fit very well, so maybe we're gonna have to change it. And it goes yeah. a lot, like a lot but, of work kind of goes down. But the big thing is that we've always kept like the main beats of the game, and so long as you can tie between all of those beats, then the length between it is not what matter uh, is not what matters so much in terms of like the like how long that is. If you can tie them cleanly, then I think the players will always be happy with it because they're gonna feel satisfied in the storytelling. Yeah. Right, and you were mentioning through storytelling in a little bit earlier that there is a good amount of lore in the game, um, and I'm yes. understanding that the lore is definitely playing a bigger role than I may have thought. Uh, can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about the lore? Uh, the lore is... I, the, it's, I think, like, hard, it's hard without spoiling much. Without spoiling too much, but like one of it is like the, the reason why some of the people in town are afraid is because the, the fishermen who die at sea are their spirits are taken within the waters, within the ocean, and that's what manifests like these weird fish and stuff. Ooh, it's yeah. taken like from people's thoughts. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's... it's Like that, their weird thoughts and their weird imagination kind of brings up things in the sea. Yeah, so, and that's that's just a, t a tinge. I want to see yeah, more, like but a, I, don't, I also don't iceberg. want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, it's, not spoiling is very, very good. Um, we'll steer <laughs> off of that just to get away from spoilers for a little bit, but how did your team approach replayability? Um, yeah, so that was a little uh, a little hard on the story. Like, the, the story, story part, part, it's mostly like we're trying to make uh, different challenges in the fishing itself, even though it's like, it's mm -hmm. a relaxing game, but we still wanted to give different levels to all the to the types of fishing yeah and it's one of the big things is that um adding value to that replayability and all the all the way we've done it is tying to that story Plus because the lore is so interesting to, to player base every bit of thing that uh, work you're doing every added work you're doing goes towards that story and uh you've got a lot of collecting so yeah, <laughs> if you that's want to that's one of the reasons why we added so many fish because we want to like People should always have a surprise when they, they're playing the game. Like mm -hmm. there's always something new and like different zones have different new stuff for you. To so you don't have to 100% all the all the fish in the game to complete the game, but, but you can, you can yeah. keep going after that and, and learning more of the stories. As someone who likes to replay comfort games like this, and I think I would classify this as a bit of a comfort game, I'm very, very happy to know that there is that option. Um, before we say goodbye, because this has been lovely speaking to both of you, how can people follow you uh, for updates on Moonglow Bay? So we have the Moonglow Bay Twitter account, an Instagram account, a Facebook page, it's all <laughs> at Moonglow Bay. And mm -hmm. we also, the studio itself is at Bunny Hug Games. On uh, Twitter? On Twitter. And also there is our publisher that is also going to be giving a bunch of updates, which is at CodeSync. Like, like coat a coat and, and a, a sink. sink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's yeah, wonderful. So that's where thank we can you. find. Thank you so no, thank much. Thank you I'm, very much. I know I'm excited me. to be taking these updates, uh, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm going to be wish listing that as soon as I get off of here. Uh, thank you so, so much for your time, and uh, let's send it back to Story Mode Bay and Trisha Hirschberger. Yeah. See thank ya. You. See ya. Bye. Thank oh you, gosh. Kate, and thank you, Zach and Lou. What a fun look at Moonglow Bay. Um, I mean, I, as soon as we got that little nugget of lore where people who die in the ocean, people who die at sea, their spirits and thoughts or whatnot kind of come to be in the fish, I was like, oh, man, this, this went from peaceful fishing sim where I want to, like, romance different people in town to something entirely different. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I love how Kate kind of called it a comfort game because it almost mm -hmm. is a comfort game with, you know, um, not the death part, maybe. I don't know how comforting that is, but it looks so adorable. And again, the art style for me is what really drew me in. It's almost like that pixelated type of look. You don't really see that too commonly in games now. And I love that, you know, they brought that back. And yeah, I'm putting it on my wish list. I need that. Yeah, I saw people in chat saying it's kind of like Minecrafty looking, but with yeah. upgraded graphics. At least that's what people were reminded of. And everyone was getting excited when they saw there was crafting in it too. So we learned different yes. types of fishing, cooking mini games, uh, sell everything in a vending machine, meeting different people in town, and just 
for Zach and Lou, like, to be indie devs who kind of created this world, I'm sure it's just mm -hmm. so exciting to invite people into the world and see what they do. Just, like, hands off, we made the playground. Now the ball is in your Go court, forth. which is really cool. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for them. All right, mm -hmm. folks, we have to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We have more exclusive trailers coming up. I see everyone in chat that's like, trailers, 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 trailers. We'll get there. We have more exclusive trailers coming up and coming up interviews with the devs from Soup Pot, Nobody Saves the World, Among Us, and more. See you soon. back everybody to the id at xbox showcase right here on twitch gaming my name is trisha hirschberger and i am joined by the fantastic story mode bay today to tell you about all things going on on the indie scene from the xbox yes oh my gosh like we were saying earlier on in the show we have such an incredible lineup for all of you uh coming up soon blind gamer steve will sit down with the team behind soup pot and later on we'll be talking to victoria from Among Us, I know everyone in the chat is waiting for that interview about the new map that will be dropping in the game on March 31st. But first, we have more exciting game trailer reveals for you. From drifting across gorgeous rally racing landscapes to surviving the cold and desolate wild wilderness, our next announcements are coming to the Xbox platform soon. Let's take a look.
the creepy, AI-driven Mr. Peterson. This character has one mission, keeping you from discovering his secrets. Hello, and welcome to Hello Neighbor 2. In this game, you'll be playing as a local journalist named Quentin, who is suspicious of his creepy neighbor, Mr. Peterson. For those new to the Hello Neighbor franchise, this is Raven Brooks, the sort of town where everyone keeps to themselves and goes about their lives. Normally, you would too, except a bunch of people have gone missing. And there's just something strange about your neighbor, Mr. Peterson. Everyone is afraid of him. There have been rumors of children going to his house and never being heard from again. Some people say he likes to lock people up in his basement. But no one has any proof. So people just try to avoid Mr. Peterson, his odd house, and ignore the strange sounds coming from his basement at night. You have a feeling that Mr. Peterson is behind all of the neighborhood disappearances, but no one believes in your ideas and theories. And while you normally wouldn't break into someone's house, you're the only one who believes something is wrong and has the guts to uncover the truth. When you break into Mr. Peterson's house, you'll be going against an AI that is constantly evolving. Our goal for Hello Neighbor 2 is to provide unique player experiences. This is an experience that is driven by the community. Mr. Peterson's behavior is a combination of a neural network and algorithms that allow him to constantly learn from his experiences with everyone who plays our game. It begins with the collection of player activity. Mr. Peterson takes note of player behavior, whether or not most players are likely to hide in a closet, use a certain escape route, or certain objects. As time progresses and he learns, Mr. Peterson's behavior may change and surprise you. How Mr. Peterson plays in one encounter with you might be different from the next, all due to his encounters with the game's community as a whole. In this way, the community's experience with Mr. Peterson changes over time, allowing for an AI that is developed through community actions, replayability, and great stories of neighborhood shenanigans. But these new experiences go beyond Mr. Peterson. In Hello Neighbor 2, players can interact with all characters in Raven Brooks, and these characters share the same AI core, but behave differently and have their own stories for you to discover. So while you might think you're just playing the game, you're really contributing to the development and improvement of Mr. Peterson's AI. We hope this presentation of our AI and development gives you an idea of what to expect in Hello Neighbor 2. If you'd like to try an early access version of Hello Neighbor 2, you can check out some of our alphas on the Microsoft Store. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the neighborhood. Here we go, here we go. Oh, Are you a Hello Neighbor gosh. fan, Brianna? So I played, I played the first one and I was kind of petrified. Like he was finding me from every little corner. I remember trying to hide in the rooms and he was right there waiting for me. So the fact that they're making a second one and he's even smarter than the first game, I'm nervous. Uh, I'm very nervous. Well, that was one of the coolest things about the first Hello Neighbor is that, you know, he would adapt to your play style and the more that you would do runs, the smarter he would get. But now not having it only be your runs, but the entire community's runs that Mr. Peterson's learning from is frankly quite terrifying to me. Although I'm super interested that they said that the other neighbors will all have stories and will be able to interact mm -hmm. with the other neighbors as well. That's super cool. I love mm -hmm. that in Hello Neighbor 2, we get a little bit of a motivation as to why we're invading this man's house. Whereas I feel like in the first Hello Neighbor, you're just like those meddling kids. <laughs> yes. That are <laughs> bugging Don't our throw neighbor. your ball over in my yard again and yeah exactly exactly yep. now i was going to say i was very happy to see that uh team 17 is coming out with another game they're the same developers that made overcooked and even the style of the game it looks very 80s and retro and almost futuristic in a way which is super exciting to see uh the first trailer that we saw with the car driving again a beautiful art style i mean wow 
these trailers are blowing me away. It is a great time to be a gamer. Yeah, that first trailer we saw uh, was for a game called Art of Rally, which yes. got high praise from the folks at Top Gear and being uh, a little bit, a little bit of a uh, a car enthusiast, if you will, mm -hmm. an auto enthusiast. I was like, man, okay, loving it. That's that's some high praise again uh, mm -hmm. for Art of Rally. Craftopia looked cool, and I saw a lot of Rust fans in chat yes. when we were showing Rust Console Edition. So for our console gamer friends, you will be able to get into the world of Rust if uh, if that's your jam. I've dabbled a little bit in Rust myself, although I dabbled on a friendly server, so I know it could be a lot more <laughs> intense if I was in a more survival-based server where everybody's out to get everybody else. Uh, but yeah, yes. console friends, welcome. Here welcome we go. to Rust. <laughs> Um, but all right, so that was just some more trailers for everybody to check out. I know chat is all about those trailers. Up next on the show, we have uh, streamer Blind Gamer Steve will chat with the dev team behind the new cooking-inspired game, Soup Pot. In Soup Pot, you'll be able to make food with a wide range of locally sourced or supermarket ingredients in traditional, ki in traditional kitchens. Uh, discover and learn more than 100 recipes while streaming your cooking on Cookbook, the in-game social media map. Okay, so we've got like a cooking game and a streaming game. Let's just take a look at the trailer. Let's do it. Oh, awesome. Oh. Hello. Oh, I am really, really excited. Hello, I'm Steve, <laughs> aka Blind Gamer Steve. And uh, to introduce our guest stars is what I'm here to do. It really makes me happy to introduce to you Gwen and Trina from Chicken Club Studios. Hello, Gwen and Trina. How are you? Hello, Steve. Hi. Hi. Hello, hello, hello. Is there anything? So Oh my God, that's awesome. So, Soup Pot, tell us all about it. What is it? Tell, tell us more. We need to know more details. So, it's really weird. So, it's like our game, it's very chaotic. It's like, uh, to summarize in one sentence, it would probably be a chaotic cooking game where you don't need a recipe. There's no fail states in this game. Yeah. You just do what you do, what you do in the kitchen. You improvise. So, the player would be uh, quote-unquote streaming their process in the kitchen and um, uh, in Asian culture, we don't really have fixed measurements for cooking. We just like, we, we eyeball everything and then we adjust them according to taste. We just listen to the voices of our ancestors in the background and we <laughs> want to replicate this way of cooking because we think it would be fun to play, uh, especially um, uh, we wanna, we wanted to do uh, the iconic cooking methods like using our fingers to measure how much water to put uh, when you're cooking rice. Yeah. That is so cool. Um, yes. And you mentioned, you mentioned we we talked before, um, like. If by the way, thank you for uh, for tuning in. This is I know it's you're in the Philippines and it's way past midnight where you are. So thank you so much. But I wanted to ask yes. because you said that it was uh, that the soupon is very Filipino and Asian inspired. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that inspiration is part of the game? Uh, so actually, like Trina and I both love to cook. Uh, that's one one of the things. And then. Uh, the pandemic happened and Trina and I were just like, oh, you know, like we're not doing anything. Like we're just at home. We don't get to eat out. And then uh, we decided to make games. 
so last year we released a demo which was called Putahe ng Ina Mo Sinigang Edition and then we looked in the streaming part of it uh, and people really liked it so one of the things that we wanted is like Gia uh, started we asked Gia to do sound design where she talks about uh, she says the ingredients names and yeah, really that carried over voice. into our actual game. Like when we saw how much people enjoyed the demo and they really like it, like we feel like we're filling in a gap where it's not too serious gaming, like it's not instructional, you know, like we want to recreate as much as, you know, how you would be in the kitchen, which is you measure by feeling, you fix things as you go, uh, things can get messed up and you know, like we just want to bring in that fun into the yeah. game and make it a game. Like the fact that when you look at games in general, cooking game is always like a mini game, just like a side thought. And we both love cooking, like we both love food also. So we wanted to put cooking itself as the focus of our game. That is so awesome. Now we did see actually a little bit in that trailer that there's a social network in this game called Cookbook. Can you tell us a little hmm. bit about that and how that ties in to the progression system in the game? So Cookbook itself, uh, we wanted a way to wrap the game. Uh, and then it's essentially like fake Facebook where you could look in and then you have like tasty like videos uh, and you learn there's also the current so, news yeah there's also current news and then essentially like you learn by watching videos of the game so you also learn techniques like through a combo fighting system that we want but then there's also an accessibility option where we've made it so that you could actually remap the controls so that you you make you you could you know adjust the game to your playstyle and uh, oh, which is something yeah, that was, I was very important. Yeah, I was going to ask about that actually, because uh, yeah. you because uh, of course I'm an accessibility advocate and consultant, so accessibility yeah. is very much a big part of uh, of my life and, and what I do. So, what are the other accessibility uh, features that you're going to actually have in in Supot? So, one of the things that like we really care for is like that dyslexia like one of our team members has dyslexia so that's very important to us uh we've that was a very long discussion you know whether we put in like Q qte or whether uh we and to balance that so that people feel like they're progressing in the game uh another thing is that drina is designing you know colorblind uh filters so that uh, we make sure that the game is also playable to people uh, who may not uh, see the colors. Uh, we've added in like the reactions, like the lines, so that uh, you have like sort of an indicator of what's happening in the kitchen. And then it was semi-incidental that, you know, our sound designer Ingredient. Oda and Gia, like they just really made the game so well like the sound design is so well that mm -hmm. all the audio feedback uh you know really helps you play the game like you could you could play it also like by listening uh and, also, and the fact that the, the ingredients yeah. shout their names <laughs> yeah the ingredients shout their names that is so that is so cool i can't wait to be able to, to to try that out now trina i wanted to ask you because apparently i understand you're you're the queen of meme over there at chicken club so I, I i heard that you, you'd said that there's some really creative and meme driven achievements in this game can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to look forward to and you mentioned to me earlier there's a five second rule achievement can you tell yeah, us a little yeah, bit about is. that <laughs> so, so, so our achievements aren't skill based they're basically um based on how much fun you have in the kitchen. So we have this uh, thing where if you drop an, ing an ingredient on the floor and you decide to pick it back up and put it on the pot, uh, the game will record that and mark that as an achievement for the five second rule because you, you're still using the ingredient that, you, that fell on the floor. And there's also this... Oh, oh no, I'm spoiling a lot of things. But anyway... Uh, there's there's also this feature um, where you have a fake neighbor in the background singing karaoke 
And if you get too annoyed, you can just throw food at them. So they oh stop singing. Oh my gosh. Something like that. Yeah. That is so that is so amazing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, by the way, we should probably, you, you, you should probably mention that there, like, you gotta make sure that you have to turn the stove off, correct? Uh, the, 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 you don't want to, like, yeah. that, that, that's gonna be an issue. <laughs> uh, you need to turn your stove off if you're not using it, because it's gonna, uh, Egoen is gonna, gonna implement a feature where if you don't turn off the stove, your whole kitchen's gonna burn. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, now, <laughs> you had also actually mentioned before that essentially there's going to be um, the ability to, be able to have like kind of different uh, types of food from like locally grown farmers and holiday food. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, so one of the things is that we have a marketplace uh, in Cookbook the social media. And then what we wanted to do is essentially uh if you wanted to make like gourmet food and which like almost all restaurants uh what they do is that they source locally and this is something that's very subtle it's not really gonna affect like your experience of the game but we wanted to ensure that the design of it also reflects that you know small like local farmers and homegrown organic ingredients are just better and like more fresh compared to like um supermarket ones just because of you know like fast food and like waste and all of those things so you don't necessarily feel that in the game because you could buy whatever you want and you know the no fail state and the the you know quirky insults that both Rina and I grew up with like that is how the game is so I feel like it doesn't push the things that we want but we've designed the game in a way that it reflects that i love that now is this going to be a, a, a like a solo single player experience or is there going to be multiplayer in this at all oh it's a solo experience uh, yeah Oh, that's awesome. So you can kind of go at your own pace. I love that. So I bet there's a lot of people kind of in the chat that are going to be wondering, like, where, like, when can we be able to get uh, our hands on Supot uh, on Xbox? So currently we we are aiming for August 31st, uh, 2021. Uh, and yeah like uh, that month is like pretty uh, important for us uh, when the game gets launched you also could actually play in a japanese and korean kitchen um, because of like how close those culture us to what we're exposed to uh, so there are a couple of recipes and then you could choose to cook in a japanese or korean kitchen also that is so really cool. Uh, I love that so much. Uh, all right, so uh, thank you so much, Gwen and, Tr and Trina, for, for joining us. Uh, where can we be able to find more information about uh, Chicken Club, you, and and, uh, and Sue Pot? Uh, we have a so website that's um, like, yeah. down there. <laughs> it's it's chicken.club. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's be, awesome. And we also have a Twitter. And we, we also have a Twitter, uh, Chicken Club. Chicken a Discord, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a Discord too. Yeah. Just look them up on, on Twitter. Look them up online. Sue Pot will be coming uh, very soon uh, to Xbox. Thanks once again, and I'm gonna send it back to Story uh, Mode Bay and Trisha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my Thank gosh, you, that was Steve. adorable. Thank you, Gwen Thank and you. Trina. Uh, okay, Brianna, are you a good cook in real life? Um, I've gotten better, yes. Uh, when I first started cooking, no, not really. But it's almost like trial and error. I love what they were saying earlier about how, you know, in their culture, there's no sense of really following recipes. It's just you let the ancestors guide you and they'll tell you how much you need to add. That's the kind of cook I am. <laughs> I, you know what? I am I self-professed, not a good chef, personally. Um, and I'm watching this thinking, oh, maybe this will make me a better chef, much like Dance Dance Revolution made nobody a better dancer. So no, <laughs> probably not, uh, but at least it might make me have some love, you know, for, for mm -hmm. cooking. I like the wacky stuff that they talked about where like you can throw food at your karaoke neighbor. Yes. That sounds hilarious. Or that when you select food or I guess pick it up, the food yells out its name yes. when you pick it. That's what I'm in for. I'm in for the wacky stuff.
or even they were saying the five second achievement if you drop some food and as long as you pick it up blow the dust off and put it back on the stove within five minutes you'll be good it's fine i'm excited to play <laughs> five second rule for real yes for real well everyone at home watching coming up we will chat with victoria from among us about the new airship map coming over to the game and later streamer dano taj will have a conversation with the devs behind nobody saves the world i oof, i am very excited but first let's take a quick break be right back back to the ID at Xbox showcase right here on Twitch Gaming. My name is Trisha Hirschberger and I am here today with Brianna aka Story Mode Bay and we're kind of like your tour guides through yes. this event today leading you to all the different sections of things that you will want to see but we do have a lot of great stuff coming up. We absolutely do. Next up, everyone will be hearing from the creative team behind Nobody Saves the World, and they will be interviewed from none other than Dano Taj. But before we get to that interview, we have more gameplay trailers to reveal. From the Battle of Normandy to the Scrum of Medieval Combat, this next batch of games promises something for everyone. Let's take a look.
It's time for my butt to sit on your throne. Yo. We make our stand here and now! No! No! I got no! That was a oh, peaceful man. last trailer. It was so yeah, calm. Yeah, XO1, the gliding sim. Uh, yes. I feel like it's what that is. If you need to just zen out. Um, I saw Blank Arcadian in chat when we were watching the trailer for uh, King of Iron said Assassin's Creed of Persia. And I just thought Ooh. that was hilarious. But you're mentioning things that I love, uh, Blank Arcadian. Uh, so King of Iron might be right up there as well. Brianna, did you have any of those trailers that jumped out at you that you were like, yes, I got to play that? 
Yeah, that first one, uh, Demon Turf, I think it was called, definitely caught my eye. It's kind of like a 3D platformer, but what I liked about it is they kind of experimented with that 2D style a little bit as well. So yeah, I, whew, I'm excited about this. Also, what I'm equally as excited about is our very next interview coming up. Uh, up now, streamer Dano Taj is going to connect with the devs behind Nobody Saves the World. From the developers of Guacamele, oh, I love that name, comes Nobody Saves the World, which is a twist on an action RPG in which you play many different character forms, each with their own unique gameplay mechanics. You get to explore a vast overworld, uh, clearing generated dungeons in an effort to beat back the calamity and save the world. Let's check out the trailer. Yo, wow, uh, that trailer was awesome. I've seen that like three times now, it's fantastic. My name is Dan Otage. hello everybody. I'm joined by the lovely, lovely human beings named Grand Smith and Ian Campbell from Drinkbox Games. The lovely people that brought you Guacamelee and Guacamelee 2 now bring you Nobody Saves the World. Hi guys. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. That, like, I'm not joking, that trailer gets me amped every single time i've seen it like four times now and it's it's fantastic the uh the music's a bop the game looks fantastic let's i mean let's talk about it there's so many things to get into we don't have a ton of time let's dive right into it what 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 do you guys want to start with we got all kinds of things uh well let's we can explain a little bit about uh the gameplay how it works and what we're going for with the game uh so yeah please i guess uh yeah nobody saves the world uh well to, to start off the that that uh, naked gray baby that you saw that picked up the wand at the start of the trailer there, that's nobody. Uh, that's who you start the game as. Uh, and so like right at the start of the game, you find this magic wand, uh, which allows you to change uh, your form into different types of forms. Uh, so, th so the game is basically like a top-down RPG, action RPG. Uh, but you're, as you're playing, you're progressing through this form tree and you're unlocking new forms and playing as different forms uh, and experiencing like completely different types of gameplay with each kind of the forms. So. At the very start of the game, the very first form you'll unlock is uh, you gain the ability to turn into a rat, and you actually use the, use that ability to escape imprisonment. You get you get imprisoned at the start of the game, um, and then uh, so once you escape from your prison, you notice that the rat has this long list of quests that the that the rat can do uh, using the rat's abilities. And when you start when you start working on those quests and completing those quests, your rat starts to rank up and gain new abilities, and you also unlock additional forms that you can switch to, which have their own list of quests. Uh, so slowly th throughout the game as you're playing, you're uh, unlocking new character classes, which we call forms, and exploring those different gameplay mechanics with the different forms, unlocking new abilities, unlocking more forms. You can see a little bit of, of the, the form tree in the video right now. You can see the, the player just turned into the, to the rat. Um, yeah, so in a, in a quick nutshell, that's kind of what the game is about. So if I so the forms, it sounds like it, it's good for you showing exploratory stuff and being able to kind of puzzle solve a little bit. Um, I assume there's a lot that goes on with how your gameplay is going to be with combat and such. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like every form has their own play styles and their own moves. Like some are about like applying status effects to enemies and taking advantage of that. Some are like real heavy hitters, but. Uh, you know, they need, like, long wind-ups, and they need an element of, like, timing to them. 
Uh, hmm. Yeah, some can fly, some can swim. There's like lots of combat and traversal mechanics. Uh, and uh, as you get further into the game, you can mix and match the abilities between the forms. So, you know, then you have like a rat that can shoot arrows like a ranger or a horse that's, you know, like biting things in poison like a rat, whatever. Uh, so the, the possibilities are nearly endless, you could say. <laughs> Yeah, we were uh, we talked about it a little bit before, and uh, I think that's the thing that intrigued me most. It sounds like there's sort of a kind of Lego plug-and-play, uh, get to pick different forms and kind of play with them. Is there, like, like how complicated can we get? It gets pretty complicated. Um, like, to start with, when you unlock a new form, the forms quests are all kind of like training you how to use that forms, because we want to ease the player into the, the new mechanics that are presented sure. with each form. Uh, so, so it'll be like getting you to use your basic abilities. Uh, but then once you've, once you've kind of started to get the hang of a, a form, we start giving new quests that you can't do with the base abilities of the form. You actually have to uh, mix and match, pull it in abilities from other, other classes. Uh, so like, for example, if you're playing as the rat, the rat doesn't have any ranged abilities, but the rat might get a quest to you know, use ranged abilities to kill enemies. So then you, so you have some flexibility on how you wanna, how you wanna do that. That's a pretty easy quest to do because uh, there's lots of options for something like that. But they do start to get more specific and they, uh, some of them are more difficult to figure out like, oh, exactly how am I gonna do this? And different customizations, uh, it, it, it gives the player some room for creativity in trying to complete the quests uh, that they're presented with. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, uh, I, that was probably the thing I was most excited for when sort of hearing about this was it, it looks very much like, well, it looks like my gym, I'm going to be honest, and it looks like it's a lot of chat's gym as well. Uh, so I think we're all pretty excited about that. But that, that sort of freedom to play within your rules as the developers, but also be able to kind of do things on our own and get, get pretty creative and, and play with like the tools that you've brought up, I think that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, not to mention, I mean, just simply like uh, a Geopart says, the art style of this game looks amazing, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, there's just so much stylistic uh, virtue to it, and, and it seems like it, it's you're taking a lot of inspiration from your past works, like like Guacamelee. Can we can we talk about like what are sort of the things that maybe you learned in the past that you brought to something like Nobody Saves the World? Uh, actually, I mean talking with the artists uh, through the development process, of course. Like, one of the goals is to try and break a bit free from what we had done previously. I guess in terms of, say, like, Severed and Guacamelee have a very, like, angular, vectorized art style, but this is more, like, hand-drawn and, uh, like, lots of lines and strokes and stuff. Uh, and we, we also wanted it to be kind of charming, but, like, off-putting. Like, I, I know, like, maybe, like, Ren and Stimpy or, like, Garbage Pail Kids were referenced in the art team, where, like, mm -hmm. it's, like, appealing, <laughs> but also uncomfortable. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like yeah, there's a see... little bit of grunge going on, and, and like, like you said, that hand-drawn yeah. art style is pretty unique, in, in because nobody does it the same, right? Not really, at least. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um... So I've seen some like some mentions and something that I sort of came up with or came up just kind of watching it for the first time was um, a lot of thoughts of like it being a roguelite. But I, I wanted to drive home that it isn't a roguelite. It's very much an action RPG. But you guys have something very special, which is I mean, do you guys want to talk about your dungeons a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the structure of the game, uh, it's kind of like you're exploring a large overworld, not in, not unlike uh, one of the older 2D Zelda games, uh, but it's scattered throughout this overworld, there's dungeons everywhere. We have about 25 dungeons right now in the game. Uh, and all of the dungeons are procedurally generated. So, um, th and they all have completely different themes as well. So, uh, so like, we have some standard things like you know a prison or a mine, but we have a lot of really odd non-standard things like you'll be exploring a UFO or a gingerbread house or you'll be going inside <laughs> of a dead dragon, uh, like just trying to do some weird, bizarre things. Um, and each of the dungeons, while they're procedurally generated, they're, uh, they all have like different rules in their generations. So each dungeon does like have a unique feeling when you go inside of it. Um, but if you do die inside of a dungeon, because you know uh, there's the dungeons are going to get in, uh, increasingly difficult. If you do, do die, you're kicked back out front, and it gives you a chance to try and create a new build 
uh, uh, to go back in again and, and try and be more successful with another attempt. Um, and another thing we do as, as the game progresses is we start to add more, more mechanics to the game. So uh, you can't just like find a, a form or a combo of, of abilities that is like ultra powerful and just stick with that for the whole game because the dungeons will present different challenges. Uh, so you'll have to kind of mix and match um, not only because you want to try and push down the, the form tree by doing quests as different forms to unlock more classes, but uh, because some of the dungeons you just won't be able to do with certain forms because this, those forms won't be well suited with their abilities to do that dungeon. So, yeah. And I was gonna pick. I was gonna try to find the most broken thing I could possibly find. Just play it the <laughs> whole time. Now I can't. We still, we still do some. Uh, from time to time, we do like uh, give the player some places where they can just put together their best, most powerful form, just because sure. they want. We want you to be able to feel that experience. But there are some builds that feel pretty broken, so we can't just let you do that all the time. <laughs> sure. yeah. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, speaking of, of very powerful things. Uh, you showed a couple, it looked like bosses, uh, straight up from, from the trailer, and I'm, that's like where my bread and butter comes from, is where I, what I'm always interested in, it's like, oh, the, the dungeoning is like super fun and super awesome, but where's the boss? And <laughs> what, what sort of things can you tell us about maybe some of these, these high level, uh, uh enemies? Uh, okay, I, I share your love of bosses. Um, <laughs> they're... They're in the game. They're not as much of a focus. They do exist. Um, the, I think the like enemies and the hazards in the dungeons are almost more like the bosses, if that makes sense. Because oh, like, yep, yes it does. You, okay, because like Understood. like Ryan was saying, some dungeons like they all have their different themes, and some of them are pushing like really hard in certain directions, like. I just came in this dungeon and there's like poison everywhere and there's projectiles flying at me everywhere like <laughs> and you're like okay well what forms and what abilities can i use to like overcome this and and that's kind of the focus of the dungeon um so then like a final encounter within that dungeon could just like lean more heavily on that uh element sure no that's cool i mean because we yeah i mean there are a lot of there are a lot of games that sort of focus on yeah well this is cool you're building up you're trying not to die essentially but you just got to get to the boss this sounds like it's very much going to be a challenge all the way through and i i mean am i am i wrong in saying that you're going to basically i mean obviously you're going to be having fun the whole time but are you going to be restarting pretty often if if you're not necessarily like just a savant at what, what these kinds of games bring to you I, I don't think so. We're not we're not trying to go for like ultra hard difficulty, and we don't want players to be like dying too frequently. And uh, although there are some sure. places that are pretty difficult, like there are uh, there are a few key dungeons that you'll have to do throughout the course of the game that are more difficult. And those are the ones that I was mentioning where we we kind of like uh, allow the player more flexibility in what their build is going to be going into those dungeons because we want them to feel like feel, like they're creating like really powerful builds. Um, mm -hmm. But but no, in, in most of the dungeons, you could probably clear them in like a small number of attempts. Uh, and like I said, there's a lot of dungeons though. And we, we really want the player mm -hmm. to be like moving through the world and exploring this vast overworld, meeting its inhabitants, and also jumping into all the dungeons that they're finding and not just be stuck on a dungeon and, and looping on a dungeon for too, too long. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that sounds like, yeah, you don't want, you don't want something to be too frustrating. It's, it's pretty cool. I like uh, I just like the visuals of looking at the the tree and how it kind of flows together. Uh, it seems really easy to read, which is a relief for a lot of things <laughs> that have been you know just kind of everywhere. Um, there's there's the, it seems like you really paid attention to how everything looks, which is cool. Um, you mentioned also uh, that there's a, a lot of high level story. Um, is there something that we should look forward to sort of getting into as far as like getting fully immersed in? What sort of what sort of story are we going to be looking at? Uh it's <laughs> there's a lot of variety. I would say. I guess that's like a blanket <laughs> statement about the whole game. Is us trying to be like charming and varied as much as possible? But like, Understood. I would personally say to look forward to some of the characters you will meet. Like, Ooh. my favorite is Marty Joe, the Hammer Curse, <laughs> who is just like a person cursed to be a, a walking talking hammer. Uh, He's got a really good storyline going on. Uh, but yeah, there's all kinds of, like, many strange people in many strange situations that you're going to meet. And actually, it kind of ties into the quests that, like, uh, have been described a bit already. But the ones we talked about are kind of like combat quests. But 
sure. The story allows for a whole lot of other quests. Like one of them is to get sat on, or one of them is to like fall in love, <laughs> and like so you're just, you know, you'll always be finding these things as you're going through the world. It's it's an exciting part of the story to me. That's awesome. No, that's 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 cool. It sounds like there's a there's a lot to look forward to. I mean, just characters in general are, are fun to sort of get attached to. Um, I'm hoping you don't make us sad with any of these characters. I, I'm not going to ask you to react to that or anything. But, I mean, you know, there was a whole thing going on on Twitter. It's like, don't cry, it's just a video game, but look at this game. And I feel like these types of games where you introduce really cool characters have a lot of opportunity to make that happen. <laughs> so so I'm both excited and, and hopefully I do not get too sad with these things. But uh, it, it looks really, really awesome. Um, is there anything that, that we may have missed that you would like to show off today about Nobody Saves the World? Uh, I think we covered most of it. Uh, yeah. Awesome. No, that's fantastic. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, before, we, before we fully wrap up, where can, we, where can we find Nobody Saves the World? Where can we see online and, and what sort of things should we be following right now? Uh, you can definitely follow us on Twitter, Drinkbox Studios. Uh, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, we just w uh, just today, even maybe just like right now, we're opening up a public Discord for the studio. So you can, if you want to know more about the game, see mo more cool stuff from the game, please follow us on uh, on Discord. I think it's like Discord.gg/Drinkbox. Um, yeah, those are the those are the places to follow us. Oh, fantastic! Awesome. Thank you all so much. Uh, thanks to Graham and Ian for joining me. Thank you to everybody for watching this. Please keep this on your list because I, I would love to see as many people play this as possible so that I have things to talk about with you all. Um, we're going to throw it right back to uh, Story Mode Bay and Trisha. Thank you both for joining me. And thank you all so much for watching. See you guys. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much to Dan Otaj and Drinkbox Studios for that interview. Oh my gosh, nobody saves the world. I really like the fact that there's so many generated dungeons so the gameplay almost doesn't feel repetitive. Trisha, how do you feel about it? Um, I thought it looked awesome. I mean, I saw, I was watching chat the whole time during that interview and I saw Simo Maso in chat says, perfect mix of RPG and roguelike which I thought, mm -hmm. yes, that's a good way to describe it. Because I mean, there were a lot of people saying, oh, roguelike. And uh, we heard we heard Ian and Graham say, well, kind of, but also <laughs> not really. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to love here from the uh, from kind of the quirky characters and interesting side missions that mm -hmm. they talked about. That I do think it's going to have a lot of replayability. I do think this is a world that my, I know for myself I'm probably going to spend a lot of time in. I think that Nobody Saves the World looks looks definitely, definitely interesting. Do you think it's something you'll probably stream? Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to check it out. And I love what you said, too, about the replayability, because I feel like there's so many games where you play and it's almost like it's one and done. But no, I want to get my money's worth. I want to play this a couple of times over and feel so excited about each playthrough that I do. So, yeah, I'm definitely checking this out. Chat at home, what are you guys thinking? Is there a game that you're super excited about that you've seen from the trailers already or a game that you're looking forward to? I mean, looking at the chat, I I, I have a good uh, feeling about what they're looking forward to. I'm seeing a lot of hype for Stalker. I'm seeing a, hot, a uh -huh. lot of hype for Among Us. I, I know oh, what the yeah. chat is feeling like. <laughs> oh yeah, um, but I mean, we've got so much to get into today, so let's go ahead and keep this party rolling. Um, we've had so many great game announcements already today, but next up we have a number of titles never before revealed. Dun dun dun! That's right, new game trailers! Let's take a look at those now. Yes. This is our world, or canon. It is a world gifted with magnificent and generous nature, albeit sometimes harsh. Besides ourselves, the Marios, our canon is home to the Pesca, the Zephs, the Arctans, and the Oasis. Oh, we must not forget the Migmes. The Migmes bring our people together and carry around crates containing an essential ingredient for our society. 
This ingredient is called a harmelin. The harmony between our people depends on it. And last but not least, let me tell you about us. We are the demigods. Our mission is to fight and defeat the noises, the mysterious monsters that threaten our beautiful harmony. The demigods will not allow anyone to disrupt our cannon's harmony.
man. So much Last Oasis hype in chat. I loved yes. it. There's a lot. There was a lot to love there. Last Oasis looks great. Lost Lost Eidolons is maybe how you pronounce it. I think it. so, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Loot River looked awesome. And I saw chat also very excited for some of those things. Lawn Mowing Simulator made me giggle. If you want a really, really intense, <laughs> very accurate lawn mowing simulator, then that could be you. Um, but Last Oasis is out right now on Xbox One. Yeah, yeah, that is incredible. And again, like you said, there's so many fans at home watching. You guys go play, go download. It looks mm -hmm. incredible. Now, I do have a couple of questions about Lawn Mowing Simulator because um, <laughs> is there a story mode? Are you just kind of mowing the lawn casually? I'm interested. I, I have a couple <laughs> of questions about it. But that last trailer for Loot River, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm excited for it. It's almost like you're moving in a puzzle type of motion. It's like an adventurous Tetris, if you will. Oh, I want to play it. Oh yeah, and the second that I see Super Hot Presents before any trailer, I'm like, yes, please, let's mm -hmm. get that. Um, it looks like it'll be challenging mixing the uh, puzzle play with the combat and the art style looks cool. The second I saw the Plague Doctor helmet and like wiping the blood off the front of yes. it, I was like, oh, this is gonna be rad. I'm into it. And Lost Eidolons was like everything I love about the medieval character creator with what looked to be turn-based tactical combat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can specifically tell that from the trailer, but that's at least what it seemed to me, which it, when you combine those two things, that is something I am definitely uh, up for as well. It looked really cool. Mm hmm absolutely. Now, which one was the one with the, the guy and he was flying in the air? Was that lost or am I thinking about a different one? I'm trying to remember all these titles. They were so good, but that one looked uh, exciting too. Maybe Last Oasis? Last Oasis was the one with like the cool airships that everybody's uh, pedaling and it kind of takes place oh, in maybe. a desert-esque atmosphere. So it might... It might be that that you were thinking of, but yeah, yeah, really, really fun trailers. I'm glad to see everyone in chat getting hyped for some games. Um, next up on the showcase today, our next guest is one of the creative minds and developers behind this small little indie title that some of you might know um, <laughs> called Among Us. And on March 31st, a new map, the airship, speaking of airships, is dropping into the game. So let's go ahead and take a look at the trailer for the new map now. Welcome, recruit. Get yourself acquainted with the layout of the top at airship. Enough slacking. Go to your tasks. You may need to take a ladder to get to certain areas. Or maybe just take a nice shortcut. Quit grouping up. Choose a room to start in after a meeting. Someone keeps trying to sabotage us. Stop their plan. Keep your eyes peeled. We definitely have an imposter here. Hello, Victoria. How are you today? I am great. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the chat is so hype. Like they are moving <laughs> so incredibly fast. I think everyone is We're beyond. Very honored. <laughs> yes, I think everyone is b beyond excited, not only for Among Us, but this new map coming out. Um, what can you tell us about the airship? Yeah, so the airship is actually dropping on in like five days. Oh my goodness, five days. <laughs> So, soon. Uh, so it's very soon. Uh, yeah, it's going to be our biggest map ever. Um, it's going to come with an account system. We have some free hats coming with it, as well as some cosmetics that you can buy. Uh, there will be all new tasks. Uh, there's going to be ladders and moving platforms. It's going to it's going to be um, hopefully a lot of fun for everyone to play with, and we are really excited for it to finally be out. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us, for those of us that really like to play imposter uh, or get chosen as imposter, uh, can you tell us what the venting system is like? Is this going to have a fully connected vent system for that pro level play? Oh, you know it. 
Oh, I'm so <laughs> excited. I'm so excited to see how everyone uh, gets around to uh, murdering each other. Oh, I cannot wait to, in, in the best ways, murder my friends. Um, but with that being said, <laughs> I thought it was really interesting from the trailer that after meetings, you're able to select what room you spawn back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, cool. you know, it it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll like definitely change up the strategy. Um, and if you know, if you spawn in the same room as the imposter and it's just you two, good luck. <laughs> I mean, whoops. Uh, do you have any pro strats for people encountering a map that has dual level play? Mm. Yeah, um, just run as fast as you can. <laughs> just just <laughs> trust no one, run as fast as you can, you know, all, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be a lot and we hope like in the future to add, uh, make bigger lobbies so you can have more players, but that's going to be coming in the future, so. Mm, that's exciting. Now, I did recently learn that the airship is going to be the biggest map available. Does this mean that there will be new tasks available as well or new death animations maybe? Yeah, so there's going to be all new tasks available and there will be one new death animation if you buy the additional cosmetic pack that comes with it. Um, as you can see, it's based on Henry Stickman, which is uh, another game that we made in the past. So there it is. <laughs> uh, it's right hand man's kill animation. So we're hoping people have a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I'm so are you allowed to tease what the new hats are? <gasps> You saw, I mean, you saw lots of it in the, um, in the trailer, but we will have okay. some new free hats, such as a unicorn hat, like a little mm. heart, some angry eyebrows, zipper, uh, a chocolate ice cream hat that is definitely not poop. It's definitely <laughs> chocolate ice cream and nothing definitely else. Definitely not poop. <laughs> definitely doesn't look like anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for specifying. <laughs> but with that being said, do you have any personal favorites about this new map? Honestly, okay, so I know it doesn't, I don't know why I'm so excited about ladders, but I am. It's just, it's just like something, it's just so simple and there's really nothing that special about it, but I just love the like simplicity of ladders just everywhere. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think that's Simplicity cool. I'm excited Simplicity or too. complexity for the players. So I it's wonder, true. you know, you said this it's is going to switch up people's strategies. How much are you watching gameplay? Are you watching streamers to say, all right, here's the main strategies that people are running with right now that would consider themselves, you know, pro level at Among Us because there are people out there who are very good at this game. Mm -hmm. How much of their gameplay do you watch when thinking like, oh man, we need to switch it up? Oh, it, it really depends, right? So we do try to keep up and well, there's there's a lot. Thankfully, we're very grateful to have a lot of people who play Among Us, so <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, but we do, you know, try to keep up and see who's playing and kind of their strategies and see uh, the kinds of cool things they come up with. Uh, but within ourselves, actually, like we with our game design and with our own like QA and our own play testing, uh, it's really a mix of like our own um, sensibilities and, you know, just years of making games and also just seeing how the community runs with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like things like, you know, visual tasks being able to be on and off, uh, having the task bar fill immediately, stuff like that, that it's kind of like through playing it, you're like, oh, this could be tweaked, oh, this could be tweaked, and not just necessarily like tweak to make the game better, just to give people options of what you want the difficulty to be, and uh, I'm sure Brianna and Victoria, you could both relate to this, but it's like, you know, if I'm playing Among Us with my family members that don't game very often, my settings are going to be very different than if I'm playing with a bunch of streamer friends that are, you know, 24-7 Among Us players. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think the cool thing, right, is just to see all the different kinds of people that come together to play Among Us, right? It's not, uh, it, we've had classrooms of people playing, we've had um, families playing. It's been really nice to see. Oh. That's so cool. I am kind of curious because I have been an imposter on my mind. Um, are you able to maybe kill someone on a ladder or one of those moving platforms or is that off limits? Unfortunately, it's off limits, but the fact that you thought of that, I'm like, all right, <laughs> someone's ready. Someone is just ready to, to kill on these things. <laughs> I yeah, I can see ask. it now, stack kill on a ladder. Story mode, babe. I know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> just just plopping on the floor. 
Just leave it push to it me. off the moving platform. <laughs> right. If it happens, we know who is sus. Um, so I have to ask you, Victoria, how much do you play Among Us on, like, I would say a weekly basis? Are you like, hey, man, this is my work. I kind of need a timeout in my personal life. Or are you just 24-7 in the game? Uh, yeah, because it's my work, I try to separate it. Like, I'll play it for charity and stuff. Um, but the thing is, is, like, I'm actually a great imposter. Like, uh, Forrest, who's our programmer, accurately called me out for being an imposter because no one was dying. Like, I was too anxious to kill everyone. <laughs> So, so I don't really play it in my off time, but for for work, obviously, I will. Fair enough, fair enough. And speaking of work, I mean, I just have to say, I feel like the team has been incredibly busy within the last year. How is the development team doing? How are you all doing kind of transitioning into this high demand for the game? Yeah, we are. I mean, one, we're grateful and excited and we wouldn't trade it for the world or anything. But wow, we are tired and anxious. <laughs> it's really it's it's been really like wild to see the reactions to it and just like playing catch up with everything. But mm -hmm. with the launch of the new map and with the account system, we're like, ki we've kind of caught up. So we're hoping that we can get more regular updates out and, you know, talk more. Um, but it has been a really, really wild 2020 and 2021 Ooh. at this rate. <laughs> Yeah, Extremely. I bet. I see uh, Riash45 in chat says, thank you to the devs for this game. And I'm trying I'm trying to keep up with you here, chat, but it's going so fast because there Ooh. is so much hype uh, to see <laughs> you, you, Victoria. Chat. And to have you answer questions here live on the stream is just super cool. And to get a preview of this new map. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just laughed at that, that murder ball animation that just happened <laughs> right there. Um, but yeah, the airship... Looks super cool. As you mentioned, it's coming in what five days now. Um, if yeah, people did March 31st. want to, yeah, if people want to pre-order or get their hands on any of this content, or at least ensure that they will be getting their hands on this content on the thirty-first, where can people do that? Well, the thing, the great thing is, if you've already bought Among Us, whether that's on PC or mobile, um, it will automatically update. It's a free update. It will be there for you on March thirty-first. Uh, and then in 2021, it'll be coming to Xbox consoles. I don't have a <gasps> specific date for you yet, but that's the news. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I, I'm and... very excited about it coming to console for sure. Mm -hmm. And with the console, can you say whether there's uh, cross-platform play as well? Mm. Yes, yes, there will be cross-platform play because you, know, you want to play with all your friends. <laughs> yes. Oh, Yay. we love that. We absolutely love that. Victoria, I don't know where time went. Things flew by so fast. We could literally talk to you all day long. But if anyone has any questions or wants to know where to find you, do you have maybe a social platform that you prefer people to reach out on? Totally, yes. So you can find us on Twitter most of the time. So that's twitter.com slash Among Us Game. Uh, you can also find us on Discord uh, at Inner Sloth Dads. Oh. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Victoria, thank you so much for stopping by the ID at Xbox showcase today. Thank you for coming by Twitch Gaming, and hopefully we'll see you here soon. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me, and thank you, chat. <laughs> Bye. Yay. Oh, oh, man. My that gosh. was so fun. I can't wait to jump into that new map, and I can't wait to see what the new tasks are and, you know, how to adjust your strategy accordingly. I saw the people in chat saying Trisha is sus. Everybody always thinks I'm the imposter, it's even when I'm you. not, and I don't know why. Apparently, I'm super sus all the time. But you know what? I'll take it. I'll take it, and then we'll adjust my strategy accordingly. And uh, what what kind of imposter are you, uh, Story Mill Bay? You know, I like to say I'm strategic, but sometimes when that imposter title flashes across the screen, it's like I kind of black out a little bit. Maybe I get a little hungry and crazy with power. And I'm just like, yes, the first person I see, oh yeah, that's who I'm going for. And all my little plan just goes out the window. I panic sometimes, it's fine. <laughs> I try my best to have a nice clean kill when you can like get somebody alone and then vent out of there yes. real quick. But it doesn't always work that way. You know, sometimes you have a kill and then 
three other players walk in it gets and, messy. and watch it happen. It, it's the luck yeah. of the draw sometimes, but the more clean kills, the better. All right, folks, we have so much more show left today in the ID at Xbox Showcase. Death's Door devs are up next, and then more exclusive gameplay trailers. Huzzah! Um, and again, just a lot more content to show you. So don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Hello everyone, welcome on back to ID at Xbox Showcase right here on Twitch Gaming. Coming up, we have very special interviews with the developers from Death's Door interviewed by Salyan83 and Technique is going to be able to chat with the developers behind 12 minutes. Ooh, yes. this is a good show. Mm. But first, uh, streamer Salyan83, like you said, will chat with the devs behind the new game Death's Door. So. In Death Store, you'll be playing as the Crow, where reaping souls of the dead is all part of an honest day's work. But the job gets lively when your assigned soul is stolen and you must track down a desperate thief to a realm untouched by death, where creatures grow far past their expuri and uh, overflow with greed and power. Let's take a look Ooh. at this trailer now.
Now that was very cool. I'm Stallion83 with me today, Mark and Dave, and they are here to talk about a Death's Door. Thank you guys for joining me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, yeah. No problem. So I want to know about the crow. Like that is, <laughs> he's awesome. He's a badass crow. I want to know the inspiration behind the crow. Well, we thought that crows were kind of relevant to the theme of death. They're kind of, they encapsulate the, the themes of the entire game, really. They're it's kind of a dark, kind of mysterious bird, but they're also pretty cute and kind of funny. So we decided to make the character a crow. And as soon as we did that, the game started coming together. Really, really cool. So what, what can you tell us about the story in Death's Door? So it's set um, in so... a world where... Oh, got a bit of lag, sorry. <laughs> it's set in a world where nothing dies naturally anymore. So this group of crows who work in this office that we saw in the trailer, um, they are in charge of reaping the souls of the dead and maintaining some kind of order in this world. You obviously are one of the crows and you get sent to a place where nothing has died for many centuries. So as you can imagine, things basically escalate from there. Very cool, very cool. So is this a roguelike? To me, it looks like a roguelike or is it an RPG? What type of game are we looking at here? Uh, it's not a roguelike, so it is just one storyline that's single player. So you can play it from start to finish and it's like an entire experience. Um, it has some light RPG elements in it, so uh, with the combat system you can upgrade your things like, like strength and speed and basic stats like that, and you can also find new weapons along the way. And out in the world you'll have loads of different secrets to discover as well, so if someone wants to like 100% the game, there's like a lot of juicy secrets in the world for them to try and find. Speaking of like 100%, what are the achievements looking like in this game? I have to ask <laughs> you that question. It's mandatory. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, yeah, that's part of it. Because we had so much fun making this game with so many secrets and so much like little touches and different things you could do, uh, we had a lot of fun coming up with the achievements as well. Um, probably, I think one of the most fun ones, at the very start of the game, you can actually pick up an abandoned umbrella in this office where all the crows work, and you'll get an achievement for using that for every battle in the game. It's basically oh a, a very weak weapon that is half yeah. as powerful as any other weapon in the game. So it's, it's a hard mode for people who want to do that kind of thing. So that might be the most challenging achievement, that one right there. May well be, yeah. I haven't even attempted okay. it myself, so I can't even comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, with a game called Death's Door, are players going to die a lot in this game there'll certainly be a few deaths to uh, have to go through yeah so it, it's just it's is it hard kind as of game nails, where you basically it's i wouldn't say it's hard as nails like if anyone's played our previous game titan souls um that would be described as probably hard as nails but this is a bit more forgiving a bit more accessible but we still think it will present a good challenge for anyone who was a fan of the old game yeah, I think okay. this one is certainly a very intense action game and it's definitely going to challenge you. But one thing that we wanted to do this time around was create something where if you are hitting a wall with like a really ridiculously hard boss, you don't just have to keep trying over and over again. You will have options you can do, think different things you can do to prepare. So you might want to go and get more souls, which lets you upgrade your stats a bit, enhance your play style, or you might want to go and search the world for various secrets. So there's um, alternate weapons that you might feel more comfortable with, and you can also find upgrades for all the abilities that you have access to. So yeah, I, I, we want people to be able to take different approaches and overcome challenges in their own way. Okay, so what can you tell us about the combat? system and uh how many different weapons can we can we use in this game i probably won't say the exact number of weapons but there's a there's a few to like change up your play style if people want to play with a more fast paced or maybe they want to use a big heavy weapon and the, the combat was kind of inspired by games like hyper light drifter maybe a little bit of hotline miami it's kind of like okay. fast paced and you have to play quite reactively to your surroundings like things can change a lot um you just have to be on your toes all the time and we were yeah, also really amazing. careful to make sure that all of the moveset that you have is very fast, very fluid, very responsive. So every action you perform, it'll be executed within very few frames of you pressing the button. So you have that kind of nice, rapid fluidity that gives you what you need to overcome any kind of challenge. 
Yeah, it looks incredible. Yeah, you want like to take the same kind of reactive. Incredible. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you want to take the same kind of reactive like interaction with like Titan Souls, like pixel art kind of games, and then bring it to the 3D world as well. Okay, so what about replayability? How much replayability uh, will this game have? I think um, like, the first thing after, I would recommend they... doing when <laughs> when they're starting and when they finish the game, then the first thing I would suggest is to continue that save because we actually let you carry on afterwards and there is loads of secrets to uncover in the world, loads of different things to do. Like we were saying before, it's a really fun one to 100%. And then beyond that, then because we've got this kind of light RPG system, you can go for a different build if you wanted to replay it. And it does change quite a lot. So you can focus on something that's far more speed and magic based or something that's more down to brute strength and range and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think that would be the, the best way to enjoy its replayability. So how many bosses are we looking at? We're looking at like, what is this right here on screen right now? Is that a uh, castle <laughs> boss? It looks really yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's basically... technically a mini boss, actually. I mean, mini is probably that's not the right oh, word wow. for it, but yeah. <laughs> so there's quite, there's a few, there's a handful of uh, good bossy characters in the game. As you progress through, you kind of, uh, the core bosses have their own storylines that develop and you kind of interact with them a few times while you're on your journey. Um, so by the time you get to them, you maybe know a bit of their backstory. You're going through their area of the world, which is kind of, they, they've left their mark on the world. Yeah, we really cool, want cool. to show how these bosses have adapted to the strange situation that's going on in this world and how they've become these like overly powerful beings. And like Mark was saying, how they've affected the world around them. So there's a lot of kind of each chapter of the game has a bit of build up learning about this boss, potentially even meeting them. And then when you do get to the bosses, it's like a culmination of that chapter and the our opportunity to up everything to 11, basically. Cool. So, um, when can uh, players get their hands on this game? When is this coming out? We're actually pretty far along with it. We're, we're almost content complete. We're just polishing and we're fixing bugs. Um, so we're hoping to launch this summer. Awesome, man. That sounds great. Um, what about like DLC? You guys got anything planned for DLC down the line? Um, we're we're focused on making right sure that... Done. Sorry, yeah, we're focusing on making sure that the um, core experience is a full, satisfying thing where, you know, if you want to explore when you're playing the game, you know that that world is entirely realized. There's nothing we're waiting to add later. So we're, just, we're focusing on the core single player narrative experience for now. And then, yeah, maybe we'll consider other things after. So if uh, fans want to follow you know more information about this game where can they where can they find the updates for this and um, they, they should follow us on twitter at acid nerve and we'll be sure to keep everyone updated so you you're and just two guys website, right that store .com two well. guys make this game is that correct um two yeah people. we handle quite a lot between us but we also have an art team so we have this awesome okay. team of uh, a couple of concept artists and a 3d modeler who work with us as well. So it's them who've created all of the assets that we need to bring our ideas to life. Uh, but yeah, we we wear quite a lot of hats between the two of us as well. It's quite a it's quite a good collaborative project where everyone has a lot of creative input. Okay, that's awesome. So the uh, noir world, when it when the trailer starts out, are we going to be in in the game in in that, or is that just for the trailer? Is that like the hub or something? Yeah, that's like, that acts as a hub world. So as you progress through the game, which is one like consistent open world to explore, um, you'll find these like keyholes which you can unlock and they kind of introduce shortcuts back into this hub world. So the actual main world is like this color, um, overgrown, like interesting place. Then there's the office where the Reapers work, which is kind of a, a noir, it's kind of depressing bureaucratic environment. Yeah, in the trailer I saw like uh, tombs floating. What's what's in the tombs? Uh, they were probably the doors. So oh, the doors. Yeah. So was it a bunch the of place doors? that the crows work. Yeah, it's called the Hall of Doors. So basically, the way that the the crows do their job of reaping souls, they have these doors which can lead them to any place. So that's how it functions as a hub. You can use the doors to travel via shortcuts to back anywhere else in the world where you were before. Okay. Well. 
thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, we're kicking it back. Thank you guys so cool. much. Thanks I very much for having us. Thanks. Oh, Death's Door. Oh, these look good. Now, I do want to say first, you know, shout out to all of, all of the developers, but especially these smaller studios. My goodness. I mean, they were even saying between the two of them how many different hats and how many different roles and responsibilities they have to create these amazing games. To, so shout out to all of you because, oh my gosh, I can only imagine how hard of a job that is so much yeah just a team of two way to go mark and david love to see it and chat was really loving this one um i was trying to pull comments out as we go i saw monkey dwellis is for real instant buy i am orvana's uh i'm sorry if i said your name wrong said devs made a really great game love the dark mood gg and uh mm -hmm. tons of love in chat for the black and white as atmosphere when we saw mm -hmm. kind of the black and white atmospheric scenes and i definitely want to know more about this world that they're fleshing out i think it really really looks cool i even saw some people in chat saying uh potential future game of the year so definitely Ooh, loving that Mm -hmm, Again, mm -hmm. way to go, team of two, Mark and David. <laughs> yes, for sure. Up next, everyone. Oh, I'm I'm excited about this. Have you ever wondered what it would be like battling dinosaurs with guns? Or are you hoping to learn what kind of weapons you'll get to use in Stalker 2? Our next batch <laughs> of trailers will provide many exciting updates to games we're all dying to play. I see you guys in the chat moving. Let's take a look at some more <laughs> new gameplay trailers. Here we go. Locked and loaded. Hanging the area. Hey, for the weak point. Protect everything that mattered. And we were wrong. What was the difference between the people on the inside or the outside? Neither of them gave a damn about the beings that power our way of life. Trespassers are the same. Murdering living creatures for a tiny piece of horn. Sunsoft present the final piece of a trilogy. A metal attacker embarks on a brand new adventure. The side view and top down action is more intense than ever before. Jason's third battle against mutant kind is about to begin. What new threats await him in a new dimension? 
The pinnacle of mutant blasting action is here. Blaster Master 03. A new chapter in Blaster Master history unfolds. July 29th, 2021. In Team Creates. Hi, my name is Zach, and I'm in charge of PR at GSC Game World. We made the original Stalker trilogy, and now we are developing Stalker 2. The 23rd of March marked the anniversary of the first game in the series, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Celebrating the date, last year we released the first in-engine screenshot of Stalker 2, followed by the first trailer and the gameplay teaser. That was our way to celebrate 25 years of making games here at GC Game World. This year we have an anniversary gift for our fans as well. It's an update on Stalker 2. It's not as big as a new trailer just yet, but we hope you will enjoy it. Let's start with something familiar, yet completely renewed. And here is the first look at the updated costumes. The zone is a dangerous place, so it's filled with different factions. The freedom and the duty are two iconic opposing forces. The first ones see the zone as a free, ever-growing state, while the second ones would eagerly sacrifice their lives to prevent its spreading. These ideologies will never meet the agreement. As you may have guessed, you will see them in the sequel. The recognizable design for each faction has been enriched with details. If you look closely, you can see scuffs, scratches and sticking out threads. Please keep in mind, the models are still work in progress. The time has passed and the new forces emerged in the zone. You can expect to see more factions in Stalker 2. Let's move on. The reception of Stalker 2 has been extremely positive so far, and we are truly grateful for that. Thank you for your passion and your interest. Stalker 2 is a shooter game, and you can't imagine it without the guns, right? Here are a couple of guns you will see in the game. The arsenal will include more than 30 different weapons. Of course, there will be lots of modifications for each gun.
finally, let's finish with something completely unexpected. We work a lot to fill the world with a decent amount of memorable details. And sometimes it takes us to completely unexpected grounds. Can you see this guy? Quite a charmer, if you ask me. But let's take a closer look at his teeth. And the tooth is gone, or changed, or replaced with a dental crown. All made with our custom teeth tool, one of the many plugins we use in the development process for specific changes like that. These tiny accents ensure each character looks completely unique. Literally every human in Stalker 2 has one-of-a-kind smile. Or green, I suppose. And that covers up our news for today. Please subscribe to our official social channels to receive up-to-date info about the game or ask any questions. We would be pleased to share more about Stalker 2, including gameplay demonstration, later this year. Until then, good hunting, Stalkers! My gosh, I mean, there was so much hype in the chat for Stalker 2. I mean, wow, I'm, I'm blown away. For those to be a work in progress, they were so detailed. My gosh. What did you think about that, Trisha? Yeah, I mean, hyper-realism. So thank you, Zach, yeah. for that update on Stalker 2. I saw a lot of support in chat uh, for the dev team. A lot of love, like you said, Brianna, for this game. The updated costumes look super realistic and fantastic. Uh, we got an in-depth look at some of those weapons and that tooth customization. Oh. Super, super realistic and definitely unexpected for me. I saw 667 Dilos in chat says these graphics are so dope. WTF mm -hmm. sexy headphones, which I love oh. your name, your Twitch name. Okay. Says, Absolutely cannot wait to play this game. Yet I hope that the devs take all the time they need to make it right. So Absolutely. I saw a couple people in chat saying like, take your time. Let's make this the best game ever. And uh, yeah, it was cool that Zach was able to stop by and show us that update of what they have so far for Stalker 2. Absolutely. And I love what you said, too. I feel like it is so important to give developers the time that they need to push these games out and allow them to do them properly. I know there's so much hype behind so many different games, but developers are people, too. They need some time. They need to take yeah. the rest that they need. Give them some time and don't worry, you guys will be happy. Just a little bit of patience. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm always a fan. I will be patient and I will wait for the game to be awesome. So again, thank you, Zach, for that update. Uh, up next, Streamer Technique will sit down with director Luis Antonio about his new game, 12 Minutes, an interactive thriller about a man trapped in a time loop. Let's take a look at that trailer now. All right, close your eyes. I want you to think of a flower at its contours, its curves. Now I want you to imagine it changing, moving backward, returning to its bud. Think of that bud, unopened. Look at it as a whole, and silently repeat these phrases. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear. May you know peace and joy. Hello everyone, welcome back and imagine being stuck in a thriller themed 12 minute time loop over and over again to figure out what's going on in your life. Well, today I have the pleasure to bring in Luis, the director of 12 minutes, joining me here as technique as you guys know. Uh, Luis, I am, <laughs> this game when I first saw it at E3 uh i was just like what is this and what's happening because it reminded me of an old movie called butterfly effect a long time ago and i remember seeing it when i was younger and and it, it blew my mind can you introduce yourself and tell the chat a little bit about yourself and about this game 12 minutes hey technique um yeah definitely so 12 minutes is um 
Yeah, it's an interactive thriller about a man trapped in a time loop. Um, the whole game happens inside an apartment. You come home from work, you're having an evening with your wife, then this, this guy shows up, he, um, he accuses your wife of murder, and then um, he attacks you, you pass out, and then you go back to the start of the evening. And then you have to use the knowledge that you accumulate every loop to try to change the outcome and hopefully break the loop. Um, it all happens inside the apartment, it's all in real time, and um, the game doesn't really tell you what to do, right? So it's kind of up to you to decide what to do based on what you experience. I love that. that. It seems there's so many setups for failures and maybe one success. Um, but before we get into the, all the complications of the game, I, we have to know, and I'm pretty sure you got hit with this question, <laughs> when is the game going to be ready? Because we are ready to get our hands on this and experience 12 minutes and find out how to overcome this loop. Um, so the game, we're, we're, we're the final stage, like final, final stages. We're doing QA, polishing, a lot of play testing, making sure that the game is really smooth, finalizing the music. Um, it's going to come out soon, very, very soon. Um, um, definitely this year. Uh, the exact date we don't know yet, uh, but once we do, we're going we're gonna to announce it. And it's happening. It's definitely happening. We believe you. I, I can see the progress over the years for sure. Um, but we can't talk about the game without going into a little bit more detail about this is a cin cinematic thriller, so to speak, and it's very interactive. So the most important key components of this is your cast and, and, and the voiceovers and the narrator. Could you go in a little bit uh, more detail about that? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the whole experience, because the game never really tells you what you should be doing, it's a, a bit about how you interpret what's happening. And so it's a very personal, um, intimate environment where it's you with these mm. three other characters, I mean two other characters, and um, and yeah, so the voice acting is there to really help. Um, like you, you, you gotta connect with these characters and care about what's happening in order to, to, um, to be able to follow the story and see where it leads. That's a very, very important factor is connecting with the characters and, and, and finding some kind of relatability to feel the emotion that your main character feels or main characters, I should say. Um, and, and talking about relate, relatability, everything happens into an apartment. So the control aspect of this game has to be very important. So what kind of controls can we look forward to uh, the accessibility of controls in the system? Um, so for 12 minutes, I wanted to uh... It's kind of a point-and-click game, but a bit cleaner than the old ones where you, you never quite know what's going to happen. You, you have objects in the apartment, like on the trailer you can see he picked up a knife, there could be a mug, there's the plates. So anything you can pick up, you can combine with other characters or with yourself. And then there's things you can like open the door, close the door. And it might seem that it's not that many uh, interactions, but each one, the characters react to everything you do. So very quickly it branches out into many possibilities. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I saw a, a tiny bit of the gameplay through the trailer. It seemed like uh, the stuff that you do pick up, have con everything has a consequence, it seems. And uh, it's kind of like a risk reward system, uh, you know, like eating dinner. Uh, what if you pick up a knife and, and you try to go after the guy that comes in the apartment? You might have a consequence of that. That's really, really cool. Um, I would love to dig more into the story narrative and the characters. Now, you have, a, a, I'm guessing that's uh, her husband that comes home. Uh, to see his wife and they're going to have a nice dinner and somebody's going to come by at some point and accuse her of murder. Is there anything else you could tell us about that? Like, I mean, does the husband not know about the murder? Like, what's going on? Is uh, it, are both shocked? <laughs> I wouldn't even uh, imagine yeah, I, I don't want to say much because it's, um, right, everything you learn will affect how you how you deal with the situation. So there's not much that can be, that can be shared. Um, mm. um, yeah, that's a tricky question. There's really not much I can tell about the story. Okay. Like, I, I want players really to go in and and um, right and have a blank slate in how they're going to interpret the situation. But it's pretty. So intense. have an open mind, pretty much, is how you need to play this game. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, like the like the situations that you're going to go through. Uh, none of them. There's no no. There's no right or wrong, right? For example, let's say the cop comes in and he starts attacking you, right? You could try to fight or not fight, but each. Each, each option that you choose will branch out in a different direction. So you're always learning and you will use that knowledge and the character also s learns everything that you've done and you're going to try to use that in order to try to change the outcome. So having a blank slate is, is, is pretty good for the player, I think. Um, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of these, a lot of the games like this do have a lot of mind tricks involved. But speaking of gameplay and keeping your mind open, how the length of the game, I'm pretty sure people are going to be like, okay, I understand th this, ga this game is called 12 minutes. Is the game actually 12 minutes? Can you expand on the <laughs> length of the game and uh, give us a little insight on that? Definitely. Um, so the loop lasts 12 minutes. Um, but for example, when the cop comes in, it's about three minutes into the loop. So if this was Groundhog Day, the film is like Bill Murray was dying at breakfast. So once oh, you actually wow. manage to, to, to survive the cop, the loop still continues. Um, from playtesting, I thought the game would last about eight hours, but so far we, we're, we're rounding up to 15 to 18 hours. Um, so it goes pretty deep um, until you reach what I would call a satisfactory ending. Man, 20, 18, you're, you're getting on that 20 hour mark and I wouldn't even believe in my head that it was gonna be that long of an experience. That's really great. Um, it, this is a single player experience, right? This is no multiplayer or nothing like that. It's completely single player. Yeah, yeah, it's a single player. Okay, so single player experience. Uh, what about replayability? Once, let's say you solve the loop, uh, what is there to do afterwards? What do we have to look forward to? Um, so, yeah, like the, I think once you play through, uh, you're going to have your own experience. I think a lot of it will be talking with your friends and, and other players about the interpretations of, of what's happening and how to how they dealt with the situation, or whatever branches they went through. Um, but yeah, this is I, we, my, my goal with this was to make something that's very clean, uh, no fat and very um, really respecting the player's time. So yeah, you play once, you enjoy this and, and then you're done. It's not like uh, those games you keep playing over and over. You know, I respect that so much. Uh, just looking at it, it seems like you're just thrown automatically into the action of it. You, you're, there is no like overall huge arcing story that you have to sit and wait a couple hours before you get to the gameplay. I, I really, really expect that. And I'm gonna say kudos to you because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you were working on this alone at some point for a good part of it? Yeah, yeah. I was developing this alone for, um, for like two, three years. And then I, um... Yeah, I partnered with Annapurna Interactive, and that's when we, we kind of managed to bring the voice cast in and, and really take this to another an all new level. Wow, that's the lighting, the atmosphere, you really hit on that thriller. It seems like it starts off all peaceful and then things get chaotic in the, in, out of nowhere. All the rooms in the apartment, uh, well, first of all, in all the rooms in the apartment itself, I'm, 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 I'm get thinking you start on an elevator or maybe you like, come into your a hallway are the rooms available to go into or is it only your apartment and if this is in your apartment can you go into every room and interact with most things in your apartment yeah so the, the whole game what you see the moment the game starts will be what you're going to have when the game ends nothing else will change apart from your knowledge of everything that's happening in there um yeah you can go to all rooms you can interact with everything and yeah if you've played before and you start again you have a lot more knowledge on how to deal with the situation and and handle things differently. Um, and I would say also like, um, the reason why it's so small and so tiny is actually to allow your actions to have very clear outcomes. You know, like if, if you imagine the loop was 24 hours, you'd get lost about doing a bunch of things in sequence in order to know what was gonna happen. But by compressing the experience to this level, right? If I lock the door, I know that maybe the cop won't be able to get in or maybe he'll do something else. Mm -hmm. And in a minute, you're back at the start and you can very quickly see the outcome of your actions uh, and makes it pretty intense too. It seems like a lot of thought process has been put into the game and I, I really like that feature as well of not giving us too big of a loop so we can just really hone in because a lot of games, especially RPGs, give you so much information in the beginning, You're reading all this stuff and you tend to forget the, the core product of the game itself. So having us in that loop is a very, very good idea. Um, is, are there multiple endings uh, you know, I'm not asking for details, you know, I just want to know, you um, know, you could solve a loop one way, but is there multiple ways to solve it? So when, when I started to work on this game, right, that question kept coming up. Mm. Uh, I kept asking myself, how, how do you end the story that keeps repeating itself? Um, so the answer is there is what you can call a conclusion, but it doesn't match what you'd expect out of a linear experience, right? When you see a movie, you get to the end, you get the credits, but this is interactive and you can participate so what we call an ending is slightly different from um, what usually movies do so 
you will reach a satisfactory conclusion, I think. Uh, what that is or, and how that is, it's kind of different from people usually expect in games. That's amazing. Lewis, I have to ask, this concept is something that we don't see often in video games. Were there any inspiration that led to creating this game? You said about two to three years ago you started it. Did you have any kind of inspiration behind it that, um, that could lead into maybe even more titles like this? Um, so early on, I, I there were some pillars that I wanted to work on. Like, so I've been working in games for many years. Uh, I've been at Rockstar, Ubisoft, work on The Witness with Jonathan Blow, and always as an artist. I was always on the artist side of things. And and this idea of repeating the same amount of time over and over, which games do naturally, you know, what if that repetition was actually something you were aware of, right? Rather than Tomb Raider, you die, you reset, and you're doing the same thing, but no one acknowledges what's happening. Um, so along with this, I wanted also to kind of um, take things from the movie industry, like from the cinematic side of things, you know, like for example, like Hitchcock, Rear Window, the way you spend the whole movie sitting in the balcony and interpreting what's happening. Or like in Memento, where Nolan changed the order of the scene so that the player feels what the character is going through, right? And, and as I started to learn to program and make the game, I realized that we do have these tools as a game designers and we we can bring them in, you know, how, how you interact with the environment, how much information we give you, how the world reacts to you. So it was slowly, each element I would bring in, I would see, is this element in the same language that I, and in the same theme and message I'm trying to convey? If yes, it goes in. If not, I would take it out. Um, so and slowly these things start to grow into, into 12 minutes. Wow, so that's... That's really cool. We really don't, and chat, I just want you to understand, we really don't get to hear the side of development, right? We, we get to see the game where we're like, oh, this is cool, this looks beautiful, and this, that, and the other. But it seems like, Lewis, you have a like a, a almost like a, uh, a movie direction or, or or cinematic background and be able to be able to lay out a game and you were just doing art side of stuff. I'm pretty sure you took a lot of those tools that you got from all those other developers and brought it into making your own. Do, do you see yourself making more titles with more cinematic approach? Because I think this is a wonderful avenue that a lot of games typically just throw for cutscenes and not really give us the player experience in. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it cinem... I, I think it's cinematic, but I would call it... Um, I think it's like the, the history of games has this background of, you know, you have levels, you have objectives, yes. you have coins and goals. I'm like, what if we bring some aspects of it but not others and and i think for this specific experience i think being cinematic and 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 bring a lot of cues you know from from films about the way the actors move the way they talk to each other the tempo and everything makes sense um and i would like to keep doing that for sure um but if the next titles would be similar i don't know but i, I think this this idea of really paying attention to the elements we bring in like for example, the top-down, the main reason for being top-down is that so that you can you can easily navigate in the environment, right? If you bring first person, suddenly 80% of the people cannot play the game because they don't know how to control the character. But I realized, mm. look, if you just click where you go, and then when, when you go into an object like the fridge, it goes into first person and out, you, you keep having all the verbs you would have in other video games, but the simplicity is there. So someone who doesn't play video games can just jump in as long as you know how to click where you want to go to it just works and there's no compromise in the design complexity i could pick your brain all day you you just seem to have an answer for everything i love it wow that is just amazing so the funny thing is i love how you chose i was thinking about the accessibility and what you were saying because i was like yeah um us video gamers are gonna be a lot of people are gonna just be like, why point and click where we can experience this a little bit more in depth. But I also love the fact that you went point and click for the simple fact of you get to see the environment that you're in and it kind of builds a kind of tense, a tenseness to it as well. Like when you hit your first loop or your second loop, you know, this guy is coming. What do you do? Where do you go? You know, it, and being in first person, you kind of panic and you lose a lot of that, that atmosphere effect. Um, being able to go into rooms, lock doors, and, and, and pick apart certain mental puzzles, I, I should say, to, to fix it. Now, I really want to know about, before we let you go today, I really want to know about the characters, because they're the most important key components, uh, components of this game right now, especially the main character that you play. 
does his attitude change through the loops or do you kind of have like a more of a monotone feel uh does he start to realize that he's in a loop and he's like oh my god and he gets frantic or the choices that you make uh conversation wise get a little bit more tense or or soothing um, yeah so that's a really good question so early on i i kept asking myself how am i going to convey the progress of the character if everything is resetting right i cannot change his clothes i cannot change I mean, nothing can change everything goes back to the start but his knowledge stays so so the idea is that every time that that you that you loop uh he hopefully he will do this journey with you i i we try to read the frustrations you're going through and he will react to those frustrations and everything that you make him do he's going to be aware so for example when you go talk with the wife everything you know is what you will um yeah every time every loop you do everything you do he will know it and be able to talk and execute on in the next loop or, or if you make him do things that he doesn't feel very comfortable the more he makes them the more comfortable he will be making them so he evolves next to you and you'll see that evolution the way he talks with the wife like the first time maybe he's very excited to see her by loop mm -hmm. 50 he's like hey how are you what's your day no 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 so oh, you see that evolution so you put that realism in, his... in it yeah yeah and okay. and we Something else we realize is by being top down, you don't see the faces. And by not seeing the faces, first we don't go into this technical challenge of rendering faces, but suddenly the body movement and the voice acting, they, they elevate the experience because you're, you're kind of projecting what they're saying to each other because you don't see exactly what the faces are doing. And it really helps Oof. keep this uh, intensity. That's I love it. The animation is going to be a key part. If everyone in chat wants more 12 minutes, I could talk to him all day. But unfortunately, I'm going to take up the whole show and we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> Lewis, thank you so very much for being here. But before you go, my friend, please tell them where they can find you, the game and every information possible to be able to experience 12 minutes. Uh, so yes, you can go to 12minutesgame.com. That's the website. There's a development blog that I've been writing for like five years now. You can if you feel like you can see the whole progress of the game. Uh, that's what I'm going to announce when we, we are at a release date and I'm always posting stuff. You can follow the game on Twitter at 12 Minutes Game or follow me at Faka Electrica also on Twitter. Um, but just type 12 Minutes Game on Google and you get all these links. Boom, 12 minutes. Thank you so very much, Lewis, for joining us. And chat, I would love to stay with you, but I got to go and send it back to Story Mode Bay and Trisha. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Take my Thank money. Thank you, Technique and Lewis. Uh, yes. I don't know about you, Brianna, but uh, 12 minutes has been on my radar for a while now. I want to say it was maybe a couple E3s ago uh, yeah. where maybe they first kind of showed us a look at it. But having that really like top down, very Ooh. personal and intimate viewpoint on it, plus the intensity of the emotions of what's going on in the loop, I just think it's a super, super cool concept. Oh, has this been gosh. on your radar too? Yes, and it looks amazing. This is exactly the type of game that I have been waiting for. Um, I definitely love to see so much hype coming in from the chat, especially because the concept of the game is so brand new and different. Normally, I feel like people would be a little bit apprehensive, like a top down view the entire game. I don't know, but there was so much hype and I understand completely. Like I said, take my money take my credit card right now like i am buying it day one no questions asked <laughs> oh yeah a lot of people in chat saying buying day one i saw that silky c said i want to play this game so bad it looks so good and the cost sense the concept mm. is so fascinating um amias 94 said concept sounds amazing well done guys instead 93 said the art design is so beautiful and clean yes. Uh, so a lot to love with 12 minutes. But we have so many other things still to cover. Next up, we have another exciting game from Annapurna Interactive to announce. Mm. Last stop. But rather than show you a quick trailer, the team at Annapurna Interactive were nice enough to send along an exclusive gameplay demo. Uh, so after that, we will then meet the creators of the game, Astra Ascending. So right now, let's take a look. Oh. Hello and welcome to Last Stop, a new game from Variable State and Annapurna Interactive. Last Stop is a story-driven adventure game where you navigate through three entangled stories that intertwine into one wild sci-fi adventure full of mystery, wonder and danger. Today we're going to show you how this game works by playing a quick sequence from one of these stories. 
In this tale, two neighbours, John and Jack, have accidentally swapped bodies in a freak accident. They must now help each other blend in as they try and find a way to get back to their old bodies and way of life. Let's take a look at how you could play this out. So where do you work? Super fan. It's not far from your office, actually. And people pay you to do this? Yeah. Some people say game makers are the new rock stars. Dad, can you put me in one of Jack's video games? I struggle enough with the oven timer. I don't think this is going to work. Don't sweat it. I'll walk you through it. Think of me as a master puppeteer and you my obedient marionette. Don't forget, I need to be taken to school at some point. Yeah, yeah. Now, first you need to find my desk. You can't miss it. It's the one with the robot doing the sick dab. Sneak past Sonia, the receptionist. Avoid any awkward questions. She's a bit dippy, so you shouldn't have any problems there. She didn't sound that dippy on the phone. You're mean, Jack. Hello, stranger. You look well rested. It's like the whole weekend. Anyway, I should probably just get going. Someone's in a hurry. Get in there, Jack, my son. Good morning! Derek's in a good mood. Who the hell was that? What? Jack, you sure you're not still feeling ill? He's my boss? Yeah. <laughs> so, what do I do when I get there? It's Monday. That means sprint planning. You're going to coordinate with your team on their tasks for the week. That's no good with stuff like that. Molly's right. I don't think anyone would follow me into battle. It's simple, trust me. Jonah's working on modelling the last of the cream cakes for Mrs. Clapton's tea shop. Letitia's putting the finishing touches to the AI for the retirement home scene with the shell shock veteran. And Tobias is writing up the design for the interactive funeral procession. And Maya is midway through implementing rumble support. Jonah cakes, Letitia shell shock, Tobias funerals, Maya rumble. See? You're a natural. Uh, hello. Um... Good weekends, everyone? Get up to anything interesting? No. Okay, um, let's see. So, I'm supposed to go around everyone and check what you're all working on. So, um, Jonah. You are... modelling cream cakes, aren't you? I'll take the silence as an agreement. Okay, Letitia. You're doing something with AI? No, no, IA. For retirement homes. Yeah, sounds right. Okay, Tobias. Are you rumbling? Actually, I'm not sure that's right. And finally, Maya. Are you doing the IA? The, the AI? One of them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure that's quite right. Look. Even I can tell this meeting is a bit pointless. You all know what you're up to, even if I don't. I guess what you're really looking for is a pep talk, isn't it? Some words of encouragement. I'm sorry. I thought I could do this, but none of this comes naturally to me. You all look like nice, bright people. You don't need to listen to an old fart like me. I'm sorry that I can't give you anything more inspiring. 
Maybe I'll just leave you with the advice that my dad gave to me on my 18th birthday. Keep your head down. Don't take unnecessary risks. Stay out of debt. Cheers. And that's just a quick look at Last Stop. Be sure to check out more updates soon as we're getting rise to console and PC this year. Thanks for stopping by. Demigods, ascend! はい、え、こんにちは。ゴズマカズシゲと申します。えっとですね。普段は日本の大手のえ、メーカーさんのま、割と対策みたいな感じのえ、ロールプレイングゲームのシナリオを書かせてもらってます。先ほどと申します。え
そこはなんか自分にとっては新鮮なんで皆さんも楽しんでいただけるんじゃないかなと思っています。Man, how awkward was that poor meeting in the last stop trailer? Like, I, f- I felt it in my soul, Brianna,、mm-hmm. how、mm-hmm. awkward it was for that guy. What'd you think? I mean, you know what? I really appreciated that for Last Stop. They gave us a demo. I feel like so often with gameplay trailers, you don't really know what's going on. Or sometimes the trailer doesn't really reflect how the actual gameplay is. So, big shout out to them. I am very excited for it. But I'm also very excited for this next section coming up. Now,、okay. we've learned so much today about unique indie titles that are coming to Xbox soon. But we know what you guys are wondering at home, myself included. What、yeah. games are coming to Game Pass? Well, I think we have the answer for you. Let's take a look. Great、My、games coming to Game、God. Pass. I mean, like, I've tried to keep track of them all, but they were flying at me so fast. Celeste, Wild、yes. at Heart, Nobody Saves the World, The Ascent, and for everyone who's been asking for it in chat, Library of, is it Ruina or Ruina? I know I'm going to say it wrong, but yes, coming to、That、Game、one. Pass, which is super exciting. Game Pass is so dope. Harrison、mm-hmm. Ave, I see you there in chat.、Um, but yeah, so we've seen. A lot of great games today. We've seen a lot of teases,、uh, mm-hmm. and of course, super hyped. Brianna and I are both super hyped about what is coming to Game Pass. But、uh, mm-hmm. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who's、yes. joined on the show today. We had Chris Charla from ID at Xbox earlier, Victoria Tran、uh, from Inner Sloth for Among Us, Gwen and Trina were here to talk about from Chicago Club to talk about Soup Pot. 
Lewis was here just recently to talk about 12 Minutes, Graham and Ian talking about Nobody Saves the World, which was awesome, from Drinkbox Studios. Zach and Lou were from Bunny Hug, and they were here talking about Moonglow Bay. Mark and David were here from Acid Nerve talking about Death's Door. And, of course, a huge thank you to all of our uh, streamer friends and guest hosts who were here today. Kate Stark, Stallion83, Danitage, Technique, and Blind Gamer Steve. You guys were all awesome, and uh, Brianna and I literally couldn't have done the show and shown you all of these wonderful uh, indie games without you. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Brianna, how you feeling? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we're at the end of our show. This was so amazing to be a part of and co-host with you. Um, I do want to take a minute to shout out to production uh, for holding it down behind the scenes. I know it is not easy putting these shows together and getting everyone in their right places where they need to be. So thank you. We do appreciate you. Now, if anyone's, you know, looking for me on the internet, uh, my name is Story Mode Bay. You can find me on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, if you're into that sort of thing. Come by and say hi. I promise I don't bite at all. Now, Trisha, where can everyone find you? Uh, if people want to find me on socials, on Twitter, Instagram, uh, etc., it's that girl Trish with no I in the girl. So just that GRL Trish. Or right here on Twitch, you can find me at Trisha Hershberger. Just my name. It's like, right there. <laughs> yeah, right, right there. there. But this has been so much fun. Uh, if you are an Indie Games fan, I do an Indie Games showcase on my channel every Tuesday. Uh, but you can expect to see lots yes. of AAAs and stuff on my channel as well. But we have a real good time. Stop on by and mm -hmm. say hi to the Dragon Rider Army. And uh, thank you to everybody who's been here in chat who's been commenting, we see you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you just for participating in the show. And also shout out to anyone co-streaming this event today. Yes. I know all the things here on Twitch Gaming uh, are co-streamable. So to all my co-streamers out there, what's up and thank you. So again, just thanks to everyone who was part of the showcase today. I hope you found a new indie game to fall in love with. And we'll see you soon with more great con uh, content here on Twitch Gaming. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.